Majority Report with Sam Cedar, where every day is Casual Friday. That means Monday is Casual Monday, Tuesday, Casual Tuesday, Wednesday, Casual Hump Day, Thursday, Casual Thurs, that's what we call it, and Friday, Casual Shabbat, The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, June 28th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, from the Uber blog Hullabaloo, Digby will be with us. Also on the program today, from the Uber podcast Doomed, old Matt will be here. The original Matt. Matt Binder will be in studio, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in ages. So much so, I had to remind him of the address. I like that. He doesn't keep any bridges. Nope. Respect. Also on the program today, Democrats finish their second first debate. And Joe Biden sitting in a bathtub of ice. Meanwhile, Supreme Court gerrymander ruling is a Republican power consolidation that may continue for years and years. Meanwhile, the same Supreme Court rules that the obvious lie the Department of Justice told in support of a racist census question was in fact a lie. And Nancy Pelosi's summer surrender tour adds new dates. Meanwhile, the Fed tees up our next capital crisis. Supreme Court will review DACA with a 2020 ruling. And Trump in Tokyo jokes with Pooty Poot over election interference. <laughs> House passes a election security bill package, which will undoubtedly die in the Senate. And Matt Gates. Files charges in Milkshake Gate. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. We're all a little bit, a uh, little bit tired. Uh, we uh, two nights of uh, debate coverage gets a little bit um, tiring. People stay awake, and uh, that's it. Um, Matt, I just noticed Matt's giant Red Bull that he's drinking. Yeah, I was up till uh, 4.30 a.m. last night working on some leads. So I didn't know they made them that large. <laughs> he's focusing on ideas. <laughs> the, I like gonna, the way you I like share with people. Talking or? trash on my girl Marianne. Oh, yeah. Well, that was just a sidebar. Leave but, her alone. We're uh, going to have a big Marianne debate on the next TMBS. I can sense it in the works. There was a... Um, uh, Matt got uh, a. I got a dossier. Got a dossier in the Majority Report uh, secure Dropbox that uh, we set up. Uh, it's a long process where you need to contact us through um, Twitter. Not not Twitter. Uh, you got to contact us through uh, what is it? Uh, our Proton Mail uh, email address oh, and yeah. uh, Signal, um, and uh, all encrypted technology. Uh, so that we can get um, a, videos that are actually um, available online. I'll just say shout out at the the JD eight hundred. Um, there you have it. Uh, all right. Well, so uh, obviously we're going to talk about the debate today with Digby, uh, both the debates, and uh, you know we're flying blind here. We're just basically giving you our uh, you know our takes on, uh, on on what happened. We will know within a couple of days what the uh, 
what the polling looks like. I don't, I'm not aware of any sort of instant polls, and generally those aren't terribly uh, effective. And I, I am also not aware of any focus groups uh, that anybody did. I, Tulsi Gabbard been... won both debates. <laughs> It's the number one search term in Google, MSNBC. Well, that is the, the other DNC, thing. And the Bilderberg group tried to silence her, but she won the debate. If she you, was the number one Google search term. If you, you actually do it. talk about Google search terms, uh, at least after the first debate, the vast majority of them were like audio failures. And it was all. If you search, it was, none who of it was is about, that chick? Does she surf war the Jews? You will find she won the debate, but you'll deny it because you're a hack. Well, we will uh, talk about the debates, but more importantly um, was what happened, frankly, in the, the, the House. And we'll talk more about this with Digby, but here is the, the setup. The, the House Democrats passed a $4.6 billion bill that was to provide essentially humanitarian aid for, uh, for immigrants at the border and to <clears throat> increase the quality of, of the, um, the centers, to put restrictions on the centers, to put restrictions on the administration, the bill, well, at least parts of it, were drafted by a member of the House um, <clears throat> who has previously served as, uh, I think, in an NGO capacity, writing human rights bills. And um, this was drafted, it was Raul Ruiz, uh, Ruiz of California, who was a medical doctor who trained in refugee assistance at Harvard drafted the humanitarian standards. Um, who had said that merely increasing funding for medical care, shelter, and other needs would not be enough when Justice Department lawyer uh, argued in court that Customs and Border Protection may not be required to provide soap and toothbrushes for children in custody. In other words, money's just not going to do it because of the way that these people perceive what is um, okay what kind of squalor it's okay for kids to be living in and um, what kind of supervision, what kind of uh, responsibility the United States have when we are detaining children, right? I mean, you open up a daycare care center and you take the kids in, there is some uh, requirement that we have in terms of the way the kids are treated. And apparently the Department of Justice doesn't feel that we need to do this with these children. So the bill passed. It heads to the Senate. Of course, Mitch McConnell completely ignores the bill. Rewrites another one that doesn't involve any of those protections. That expands um, enforcement money for ICE. And that bill passes with significant Democratic support in the Senate. I think about probably half the caucus, maybe a little bit more, because Chuck Schumer is a garbage leader of the Democrats in the Senate, completely missing in action. You remember Chuck Schumer? Chuck Schumer is ostensibly the leader of the Democrats in the country. Arguably, it's Nancy Pelosi, but Chuck Schumer is in the Senate and he is the leader of the Democrats in the Senate. And you haven't heard his word because the last big bill he had was a bipartisan bill that he rolled out to stop, to strengthen essentially the do not call registry. I'm not being facetious about that. And um, so he basically must have given a pass to everybody in the Senate to vote on this piece of garbage bill. And when it came back to the House... The 25 members of the Get Stuff Done caucus, the so-called moderates, apparently Nancy Pelosi felt that she was going to cater to them, completely caved, did not even negotiate anything on the bill, and passed the bill in the House. And by passed it, I mean this. It was with a majority of Republicans. 
She's the Speaker of the House. There's nothing going to get to the floor that she doesn't want to get to the floor. She did so ostensibly because Mike Pence had given her assurances. Private assurances. In other words, worthless assurances that the administration would abide by some of the restrictions she had sought. They included a requirement to notify lawmakers within 24 hours after the death of a migrant child in government custody and a 90-day time limit on children spending time in temporary intake facilities. So it is trust without verify in terms of this administration. Of course, why wouldn't anybody trust this administration? Right. I mean, it is just bizarre. And. Even if they do notify us, like the kids are still dead. Yes. It's like Natasha Leonard said in the forward to her new book, Democracy Dies in Darkness. It also dies in broad daylight. Yeah. And here is uh, AOC responding to the. The fact that this bill. um was about to pass. I think this is just before it passed. And it looked like it was going to be inevitable to pass. Abusing kids at our border. And Mitch McConnell immediately smacked it down in order to pass and ram through a Senate bill that has an enormous amount of funding for military, as well as no guardrails and no accountability for facilities that are abusing our kids. So that's the bill that's in front of us here in front of the House. However, we didn't even bother to negotiate. There are House amendments. We could have negotiated it in. We could have conferenced. We could have tried to get amendments in to get humanitarian provisions put in, to get consequences for facilities that abuse kids in. And instead, what we're doing is that we're immediately going to just saying yes to what got passed out of the Senate. And these are two completely different dynamics. The Senate, you have a minority Democratic Party there. And here we are. House of Representatives, and we are a House majority, and we need to act like it. But, Congresswoman, didn't you vote against the House version, too? I did. I did. And the reason that I did as well is because I, I understand you had Julian Castro right before. He disagreed with even the House version of the bill, as as do I. I do not believe that we should more uh, money to ICE. My district is 50% immigrant, and I have an, o- an obligation and a responsibility to protect them. I believe that really what we should ideally be doing is passing a pure humanitarian bill to get money straight to those kids. No tricks, no writers, no poison. Yeah. We need to get toothpaste, toothbrush, soap, and we need to make sure that these kids are protected as well as having their resources funded. And the fact that this is even a game is, a frankly, a, a huge, huge disappointment. Well, if you oppose the Senate bill and you also oppose the House bill, I guess I'm wondering what it is that you're willing to support that could pass in either the House or the Senate. Pause it. Let right. me just say, like, you know, I don't know if Jake Tapper... I, li- I Listen, I do... Um, not too dissimilar stuff as Jake Tapper. And there are times you get distracted, but she literally just said he we just could pass a clean um, uh, humanitarian bill. Uh, and now he wasn't listening to her or he just wanted to pace the interview differently or wanted to try and emphasize this notion that somehow uh, she's being unreasonable or whatnot. But uh, continue. I just that you're willing to support that could pass in either the House or the Senate. Right. And and once again, I think that a pure humanitarian bill could pass. I do not believe that Republican voters are are interested back home in preventing kids from getting toothbrush, toothbrushes and toothpaste Pass just the money for these uh, for for these kids. In addition, if the president wanted to, he could he could declare an emergency right now and get that money to those kids, because right now what he's able to do is he's able to put billions of dollars from the Pentagon hold funds from getting dispersed in Puerto Rico in order for him to build an an inanimate wall. But he will not lift a finger in the same capacity in order to get toothpaste to those kids. So go ahead. So I I think that what we can do, A, there's that provision with the president, but also what we can do is pass a pure humanitarian bill. But you know what? Even if it came down to it, if it came down to brass tacks and we had to negotiate in an imperfect bill with House amendments, that at least is better than the situation that we have right now. 
So there's a lot of people on the uh, left in the caucus that are really pissed about this. I mean, be, being extremely vocal about it. Uh, and they should be because you're holding up stuff for a very small minority in the House. And it's almost impossible to imagine. And I'm sorry. These people uh, ran in these uh, districts and they may or may not know them. They obviously know them uh, better than, than people who don't live in those districts. But it's very hard to believe that a bill that provides more humanitarian protections for children in the wake of the photo of that dead girl and her father, in the wake of the stories of these babies, it's really hard to imagine that these 25 some odd so-called moderates would be endangered in their districts if these amendments were added. Here's just a couple of the quotes from some of the leading Democrats in the House that are not part of uh, the leadership, although the leadership was split and largely on generational lines, as far as I can tell. Hoyer, Clyburn, Bustos all supported the bill. The so-called second tier of leaders, Hakeem Jeffries, who's no, you know, this guy is not that far to the left uh, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Ben Ray Lujan, uh, Catherine Clark, they all voted no. Mark Pocan, who is the chairman of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, the co-chair, I guess, with Jayapal. Um said of the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is the 23 Democrats, moderate Democrats, and 23 moderate Republicans, so-called, uh, tweeted out, since when did the Problem Solvers Caucus become the Child Abuse Caucus? Apparently, Max Rose, who's from Staten Island, did not appreciate that. He said, that's why everybody hates this place. I got news for him. Wham, it's Max. not... Maybe the it's the why child abuse hates. Yeah, exactly. is why everybody hates this place, Max. Um, Pramila Jayapal said she blames the Senate Democrats first and foremost for putting us in this position, which is a very, very fair assessment. It is extremely difficult for the House Democrats to vote down a bill that has gotten almost a uh, total majority of Democrats in the, in the Senate. She said, uh, Jaya Paul said, I'm looking for a new pharmaceutical drug that builds spines. Yeah. Nice. Or develops a conscience. Yeah. Recognizes yeah. the child abuse is unacceptable. Jared Nadler uh, voted no. There's honorable mention for an older member of the caucus. I was, t I was just talking specifically the leadership, but... No, um, I, I, no, yeah, I mean, I guess, isn't he chair? Uh, well, he's chair of the House Judiciary, but um, I'm talking like no, literally the... Um, people who have specific positions in the leadership, uh, you know, and obviously like Clyburn and, and, and Stoyer, uh, uh, Hoyer are going to vote with, with Pelosi, I guess, in this instance, although it's just sort of shocking. Um, and certainly a decent amount of those votes were there just to basically make it appear like it's not as brutal of a loss as it is, but it was. Um, we will talk more about that with Digby. In the meantime... One of today's sponsors is Skillshare. Anyone who goes to skl.sh majority report four is going to get two whole months of totally free access to Skillshare's entire library, super quality online courses and tutorials. Skillshare, as you know, <clears throat> is a vibrant online learning community. It offers courses on everything from design to video editing, photography, business, technology, cooking, meditation, everything in between. There are Skillshare courses for everyone. You're going to have no problem finding courses that are going to be useful to you in both your personal and professional life. Whether you want to sharpen your skills with something you already love doing or you want to learn how to do something totally new, Skillshare has you covered. They have courses for entrepreneurs, courses on computer coding, web development, personal nutrition, 
learning new languages, Photoshop, you name it. I have already picked out the classes I'm going to be uh, watching uh, during the, our uh, brief J July 4th hiatus. Um, where are they? Wait a second. Here we go. Uh, Think Like a Chef, A Beginner's Guide to Cooking with Confidence. Productivity Masterclass, Create a Custom System that Works. I'm also going to do the uh, Real Productivity, Create Your, your Ideal Week. I'm going to get, that's the way I do this. I'm going to be doing that, um, what do you call it, dreaming thing? I can't find that. Lucid dreaming. Um, but I'm doing all the productivity ones, getting all the tips. It's going to be a new Sam a week and a half from now. Oh, boy. Yep. Watch out. And I'm not going to tolerate the lack of productivity in this office. My mother was reading me a report on the Social Security Actuarial Table. And then we were in the Sifari Desert. Is you, you lucid dreaming. Oh, I see, I see. See? Uh, not being productive. I'm not I was gonna joking say, about that happening. That's obviously not going to happen, but this, you can, the lucid dreaming will happen. That'll be interesting. You can get two entire months free of access to every single course offered by Skillshare by going to skl.sh slash majority report four. Just think of everything you're going to have at your fingertips for two whole months. Again, that's skl.sh slash majority report four. I put a link in this uh, underneath the video, put a link in the uh, description of the podcast. Check it out. All right, quick break. When we come back, dig me. That brings back a lot of memories. My college days. The cure, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, folks, speaking of a song that brings back a lot of memories, this one, this one reminds me that it's probably Friday. Are you ready for some TV? There you go. <laughs> not not a hugely complex song now that I think about it, but uh, it ain't Beethoven. <laughs> it's not. It's not Beethoven. Uh, Heather Parton Digby, welcome to the program. Uh, it is Friday. We have we are we are in the the wake of uh, the first of the first two debates. Or I should say, the two first debates of the uh, of the Democratic primary. I want to get to that in a moment. Uh, I also want to talk about these uh, Supreme Court um, uh, rulings. Super important, probably more important than anything else uh, during the week. But uh, somewhere in between there was not just the bill that passed in the House, but the way that it did, or I should say, that passed and will I think be signed by Donald Trump. But the way that it did, I just went through the whole thing with this uh, funding bill. But I, I want to get your take on it. Like th th this seems to me like I I don't understand what the the hell Nancy Pelosi is doing. Well, I, I, I in normal circumstances, I would assume that what sh what had happened and from what I've read and, you know, as far as I can sort of sort through the details of what was going on with this, that she had been negotiating with the White House 
And they had been, you know, kind of going back and forth on finding some way to at least put some of these House supplementals into the final bill. She was kind of doing a reconciliation sort of uh, negotiation with the White House. Um, But when the Senate came and (laughs) voted uh, to, you know, it was like something like 83 to 8 or something, uh, you know, with all these Democrats voting for the Senate bill that didn't have these House supplementals, it kind of cut the legs out from under her negotiation in the House for the final bill because that gave the blue dogs, the, the, the moderates who were, you know, chomping at the bit apparently to, I don't know why, I mean, it wasn't like there was any... They weren't doing it out of some sense that, oh, we've got to get something done for those kids. It was more like, I don't want to take a chance on voting for something that seems like it, it you know, isn't Republican enough. Um, but whatever that dynamic was, it seems as though that sort of cut the legs out from under what, what, what she was trying to do. Now, maybe that's been from her office, and I'm just sort of getting that because they're trying to, you know, cover for her. Right. But whatever happened, what it did show was that, you know, Pelosi's hold on the caucus on an issue like this, uh, is tenuous, um, and the problem is, is that the power, as usual, uh, is in the hands of these moderates who are, for whatever reason, decided to flex their muscles on this particular bill and show that they had the ability. And this has always been true of blue dogs. All of you who are listening, I'm sure, who've been listening and reading this stuff for years. This is how that dynamic works, is that they threaten to go with the Republicans. And, you know, that is always a problem. This is the first time we've seen that kind of a a split sort of shown, obviously, in the House. And it's disturbing, uh, mainly because it's about, you know, helping these kids at the border. I mean, that's really what this this bill was designed to do. And um, the fact that they chose this as, you know, kind of, you know, it's actually quite typical – um, sort of holding the the lives and and well being of a bunch of vulnerable people over the heads of of the uh, the liberals and saying, look, well, you want to do nothing, or are you going to do it our way? Which is the way that that seems to work. If you go back to the health care bills and various other things, you can see that same dynamic at work. And uh, it was it was disturbing. And I I don't know whether or not it was the fact that you know Pelosi just. They were in a big rush. They needed to get this done, and and there was some reason to believe they do need to push more money to the to the border for sure. But um, you know, this was a very uh, disturbing kind of uh, portent. I'm afraid of maybe what we're going to start to see happening again. We've seen it before, and we'll see if it happens again. So Pramila Jayapal um, singled out the Senate Democrats, as far as I can tell. Rightfully so. Yeah. How is nobody from Pelosi's office doing that? Like, I mean, I like, like if if that story that she got completely undercut by the Senate is correct, how is it there are no complaints out of her office? Like, I mean, well, like, there's one of two things that happened here, right? I mean, it's either Chuck Schumer was the one who basically screwed her right. over, right? Because it is very difficult to hold your caucus. When the Democrats in the Senate all abandon you, essentially. And um, now maybe they just want to get home for the holidays or whatever it is. I mean, I honestly like, you know, it's like I've got four days. I'm going to go out. there. You know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's because there's so many of them that are running for president that they all. <laughs> I, I mean, I, honestly, like that. I need this time. But um to go and campaign, but th- this is really messed up because I just don't get it. Like I don't, well, here's what I don't get. I understand. I don't agree with it, but I understand like I can wrap my head around the idea of we need to be passing bills. We need to be showing the American public that we're going to fight for them legislatively and we don't have time for impeachment. And that's why we, we need to do this stuff. I understand that, you know, I don't agree that it's the right course, but I understand the, the, like it's, it seems like a fairly logical um, uh, argument to make, but they're not doing that. They're, they're doing less than nothing. Well, and particularly since look, this, this, this bill is one of, uh, it wasn't a symbolic bill. Right. This was one of the few things that was actually going to have some immediate effect on, on human beings. And, you, you know, you could have made the, the case 
And, you know, again, this is like not wanting to confront Trump, right? Because the reason that the, I mean, what the, what the progressives in the House wanted and what Pelosi was apparently negotiating for was a set of accountability measures to ensure that the administration fulfilled its purpose in what this money was being used for and that it was being held accountable, you know, through, through you know, various methods of, of uh, inspections and various things like that. I mean, it wasn't like, I mean, it really wasn't that big of a deal. It's the kind, it was oversight, right? I mean, essentially it was congressional oversight saying, look, you know, we got to take some action here to ensure that this money is going to be used properly because look what you've been doing. Now, if you want some symbolism, fighting for that seems to me it would have been a really brilliant move, right? I mean, get up, make speeches and say, yes, we want to help those kids at the border, but we can't just throw money at Donald Trump. We know what he does with it, and they've not been, you know, we need to get some accountability in here and make sure that those kids are taken care of. That would have been a good argument for them holding up the bill, in my view, because it fits with the whole panoply of, of accountability issues again with this, with this president. But see, this is where the weakness is, is that, you know, and I can't help but look at this. Just if you're somebody who doesn't follow politics and you don't know Pelosi and her, and her caucus and the various, you know, factions dueling with one another, et cetera, et cetera, what you see is Democrats were afraid to go up against Donald Trump. That's what you see. And, and you know, you can't – there's that feeling in the pit of my stomach that all of this behavior – on the part of the Democrats, the fear that they seem to have. I mean, sure, they'll get up in front of the camera and shake their fists, but when it comes to actually doing something, impeachment or, you know, certain, you know, a bill like this or whatever, using the power that they have to educate the American public about what's going on, they just, you know, they just hold back every time. And that looks like weakness. It is weakness. And people can smell that, you know. I mean, I just think that, that I mean, this is not what people sent the Democrats to Washington to do last fall. I mean, it was to stand up in situations like this and oppose Donald Trump. Right. They wanted to see them do that. And, you know, and look, you know, go uh, the, the, there are progressives out there willing to go in and take the fire, too. You know, they would have been standing up there saying this stuff. The moderates, if they wanted to hold back and not say anything, the people would have said, okay. But when it came to doing the debate on this and to actually, you know, voting – uh, and and getting up and 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 making taking a stand that's what people want at least that's what, how I see it I mean I just this it, it, this constant sort of caving in small ways and big ways uh, uh, on these sorts of issues where there is a, a a case to be made that that this administration is being cruel it's being you know dishonest it's being corrupt uh, maybe even traitorous in some ways uh, they just won't. You know, they won't really put their muscle behind it, and that's very disappointing. At least it to me. Yeah, and it's 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 also hugely, I think, politically problematic too. I, I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I I don't know what the answer is to it. I mean, but it is interesting to see at, at the very least, to the extent that I am encouraged by anything, it is that there are. There is a concerted effort to push back on this within the Democratic Party, which in some respects is also a relatively new phenomenon. Like this phenomena is not new uh, that we're w witnessing here. It's just sort of shocking that they're still doing this, even with a president who is this, um, this despised, right? I mean, has this low of favorability ratings. Um, this move by the Democrats is not atypical. What is slightly atypical is that you're getting someone like Jay Paul calling out the Senate Democrats. You're getting someone like AOC going on and, and, and taking the and taking Pelosi to task. Um, that, I think, is is helpful. Um, but it really does. Hammer home the point that we just need a new generation of leaders, it seems to me, in the Democratic Party. And I, I, to be honest with you, like, I think we're um, we're still a couple of years away from seeing those people emerge. But if it takes someone who's a freshman, you know, to to rise to the leadership, uh, you know, I am much more inclined these days because for all of the prowess that we attribute to Nancy Pelosi in terms of holding her caucus together. Like if you can't do it in this situation, 
you know, all right, well, you know, what do you bring into the table? And so I don't know. It, um, uh, I just find it incredibly discouraging. Um, and, and, and let's just, before we get to the debates, just talk about these two uh, Supreme Court hearings. I had mentioned them last night before our debate prep, but one was the ruling on the census question, which, you know, is um, it's it's a win to the extent that, you know, uh, it, you know, there's no it may be revisited in some fashion, but it um, it would have been such a huge blow to the credibility of the Supreme Court to side with the Department of Justice's explanation as to why they wanted this question on immigration, or I should say citizenship, in the census question, when we now have literally an entire documentary record of how they are lying about that. Like, like in some respects, you would almost want the Supreme Court, if they had the capacity, to fine the Department of Justice for contempt or something, for lying so obviously <laughs> to all these courts. Uh, because this information came through, but that's encouraging. But let's just talk about the the gerrymandering one because the implications of that Merrick Garland seat now are that we have at least a half a dozen states who can have situations like we have in Wisconsin where you have 54% of the votes go to Democrats and the Republicans control 65% of the seats in the state legislature. I mean, this is just... So effed up, it's unbelievable. Well, and it's so incredibly openly partisan. I mean, like this isn't even the the the, the argument for it, which just cracks me up. Yesterday on on uh, Twitter, they, there were a lot of Republicans, people like Scott Walker, you know, that were making these excuses for this, saying, "Oh, well, it's perfectly fair because all the Democrats are in the cities, so that's you know that that so they get representation for their city." And then, but there's all these other counties out here and other places where, you know, there aren't, where, where the Republicans are. And I'm going, you know, we don't have representation for rocks or for cows. That's really not what, what this is about. It was supposed to be that humans, you know, actual human beings, people who, who live in this country, um, would be, rep, you know, represented um, <clears throat> proportionately in our government, in our, in our government. And, you know, they're just basically saying, yeah, we're, you know, all the cities, they're just sort of ghettoized into these, you know, these small districts where you get one representative and, you know, that's how we do it. But then we're going to allocate all this. So we're going to make sure that there are many more uh, people represented by the Republican, um, you know, the, the right wing conservative Republicans who would be more likely to represent people out in the, out in the rural areas. And that's really what they're saying. And it's, it's so blatantly undemocratic and so clearly partisan that, um, you know, it, it kind of shocks me, <laughs> to be honest with you. I really, I really didn't expect that they, would, that they would do it, and I don't know why. Everybody said, you know, they're going for it, you know, they're going to do it. But I, it really is, I mean, I think that this is a signal of just how openly and blatantly partisan this court is really going to get. And, you know, going to the census question, you know, look, you know, Chief Justice Roberts, you know, apparently he, you know, he was the swing vote and he voted to, to send the, the case back uh, and sort of mentioned in the, in, and it was mentioned in the, in the opinion, you know, well, you know, they weren't exactly honest. They didn't exactly tell us the truth. Um, so, they, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, they lied blatantly. Um, but, you know, his, his, he took that position, you know, most of the legal scholars that I've read say, you know, well, he's trying to show that, the, you know, the court really isn't so, so nakedly partisan. And, it, you know, it doesn't pass the smell test because when it comes down to something truly important and consequential, this court is as far right as we've ever seen. And we're going to see more and more of this. I mean, that yep. you know that the Federalist Society lawyers and the, and the, the Republicans in the legal community – are pushing as hard as they can to get these cases before the court. And they're going to, and look, they don't even have to hurry because this court majority is going to be there for a long time. It's going to be super durable. I think Thomas yeah. is going to retire um, in, uh, in, he may retire in the next month or two. 
uh, he may announce that, like literally days away from announcing it, or oh, I think he could. I think he could wait or and retire. Could, you know, three months before the election, and yep. let Mitch McConnell just kind I, of stick it to the Democrats. I you think. Know, just for fun. Yep, I think that's what they're going to do. I think that's going to be a way of engaging. They're going to back put that in their back pocket as a way of engaging. A lot of those Christian conservative uh, voters yeah. who came out and voted for Trump last time, because it's going to be a reminder. It's going to there, there's going to be this sort of like they I think they look back at the Kavanaugh hearing and say that was helpful. And um, they may or may not be right about that, but I think they're thinking that was helpful. And maybe the next person we bring up there will offend the sensibilities. The questioning by the, the Dems will offend the sensibilities enough of people and it'll bring more people to out to vote. So I, I suspect, he's right. um, you know, he's going to resign probably this time next year. Yeah. And, uh, and, and McConnell may just wait until like, you know, August to start the hearings yeah. so that this is fresh in people's minds. Um, the uh, let, let me just say, that, though, on the uh, on the on the gerrymander um, uh, thing, the idea like the argument that they're making about we should have areas represented. I mean, I think there's something to that insofar as like we have states that are represented. Right. Um, that theoretically of different regions that may have different types of problems. But the, the argument is just shown to be BS when you have these different types of regions, the rural parts of Wisconsin, let's say, are overruling what can happen in the in the cities. Like, right. you know, like it, 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 it cuts both ways. If you could say like these individuals are being denied uh, Republican, you know, in all these rural uh, uh, sections of the, of the state, which is, I think, not quite correct but even if it even if that was that's not the way that state legislatures work they dictate over over the cities or you know uh, the they let me put it this way their their purview is beyond the local geography uh right. that they inhabit so it's just at the end of the day it's all about uh, numbers i mean i just i Right, and on a, on a national level, let's not forget. I mean, all these states get two senators. You know, California gets the same number of senators as Alaska, and you know we have, you know, what you know, thirty times the population. I mean, it's insane. So you know, this is there is that sort of you know on the national level, there is that kind of of you know enhanced representation for under you know underrepresented areas, say. So, I mean, not that, that that has anything to do with the House, but it, there is this other House in, in in the U.S. Congress that sort of makes up for it. Uh, I also uh, find it hilarious that he is arguing that, um, uh, Walker does, that the, it doesn't mean they should have a larger share of the seats just because they win big uh, by big margins in some districts. Well, the reason why they're winning by such big margins in a lot of these districts is because they've been drawn in such a way to corral as many Democratic votes <laughs> right. in as uh, specific of a location as possible. That's the that is exactly the plan with the uh -huh. gerrymandering. And we should say that one of these um Cases that are in front of, that was in front of the Supreme Court, uh, I think it was North Carolina. Those districts were drawn, literally drawn, by the same guy who came up with the plan to put the question on the on the census. That guy Hofstetter, uh, right? And so, it would have made it that much more embarrassing, I think, for the Supreme Court to do it uh, now. And I guess like. I don't know. I'm of two minds on that because it would have been nice to rip the Band-Aid off and mm -hmm. to sort of yeah. stop with this pretense that the Supreme Court is uh, anything other than completely politicized and partisan. Um, and this, this, this thin veneer that basically, you know, uh, keeps any sort of dramatic reform at bay or calls for it, I think, is really... Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's part of the, I think that's that that's what Roberts, um, I think, thinking is in this. But all right, let's talk about the debates. We okay. had two debates. Um, you want to start with the first of the first debates or the second of the first debates? <laughs> or should we look well, at them I don't know. both let's, together? Let's look at the whole thing, you know, that let's I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's it's. 
I mean, we can do it however you want. It's, it's your well, show. Yeah, um, no, I mean, let's look at the whole thing. But let's just start with this before we get to sort of the horse racy stuff, which is sort of inevitable when you have 20 some odd people running right. in this race. Um, and before we, we talk about, you know, uh, Marianne Williamson or whatever, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, w- from a policy perspective, right? Like just the, from the, you know, like how much, because you, p- people like you and I are always looking for, um, for the policies to be discussed, for there to be a vigorous debate about the policies. I feel like there was too many people involved to achieve like a, an opportunity for people to learn things. But my sense is, is that I'm also super excited because I feel like every single, almost every single person on the stage would have been to the left of at least the major candidates in 2008. There's no doubt about it. There's just no doubt about it. I mean, I had exactly the same feeling. You're right. You can't really get deep in to, to policy. And even then, you know, debate. Uh, you and I want to see that, but I'm not sure that the rest of America wants, you know, deep, you know, in-depth discussions of details of policy um, beyond what you would find in a normal town hall, say. You know, I mean, so I don't, I don't know. If we're, we're not going to get the Lincoln-Douglas debates. So let's just put it that way. Um, but I do think that that these things are are generally they're sort of a they give you a sense of where the party is, where even especially with this big group. In the beginning, you're sort of looking at it. I mean, I found that when I was watching the Republican debates too in in 2016, um, that you know you get a sense of where the party is, what their what their general sort of you know where the the center of gravity is at any given time. And for many years, you and I watched this. We watched them tack more and more and more to the right. And in fact, there was an interesting article in the New York Times this week where they had mapped it. It's called the Manifesto Project, if anybody hasn't had a chance to look at it. And you can map how the right went right over the last 20 years and how the, the Democrats chased them right. You can, it, it's, all, it's mapped. You can see it's, got a, it's, you know, it's scientifically designed to study. And then in 2008, it halted, the, the, the move to the right, and it started tacking left. And, of course, it's since then has, has picked up speed. Now, what is interesting here and important to note is that when they, when they mapped out where the public was on any number of issues and various you know, uh, data points that they used, the Democrats are still – you know, they're left and they're center left. They're not way left. They're not, you know, so far. I mean, they compared them to other parties in Europe, for instance, um, you know, the left wing and the right wing parties. The right is still way off, you know, on the edge. The Democrats are still, you know, they're very much within the mainstream. I guess that's what I'm saying. But what made what, what we can sense in 2008 is the right period to be looking at, 2008 until now, that the party has been tacking back rather than chasing the Republicans and trying to, you know, uh, just sort of fudge the differences and, you know, shave off a few points on, on either end or whatever. And in the old days, you could see where that, that, that the party was trying to do that. that. They're not trying to do that as much as they were. And it kind of goes back to our earlier conversation that I think maybe the leadership of the House is kind of still in that mode. Yeah. And <laughs> not recognizing that the center of gravity of the party and the mainstream of, the, of America, which, by by the way, the mainstream stayed pretty, pretty static. It's not really, it's always been this certain, but, you know, it's just been that the right was so dominant in their, you know, in their, in their rhetoric and in their, well, they, in their they, intensity, it certainly dominated the media. I mean, in the intensity, right? I mean, this has always been yeah. the big story of, of, of American politics, as far as I can tell. It is that the right is far more engaged. And it's, right. you know, it's, uh, you know, people talk about like there is 80 percent desire for uh, gun control, but the intensity of that 80 percent is low and the intensity of the, you know, small percentage who don't want any gun control is super high. And so, I mean, I, I just point that out only because um, so many people have a mistaken perspective on what drives politics and, you know, um, to the extent that people like you and I in particular are accused of uh, preaching to the choir, he, he, here's the dirty secret. It's the choir <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. that that moves stuff in this country. And it just so happens that uh, the Republican choir is bigger. It's not that they're, you know, getting the, um, the disengaged. It's just that there's just more of them that who are more engaged. 
Well, and that's true, and, and, and I think that's, there's a chicken or the egg kind of question on this, too, because they have a leadership that, you know, actively seeks to, you know, uh, give them what they want, yeah. whereas the Democrats, for, for, you know, the last 25 years, spent most of their energy trying to, you know, separate themselves from their own base and saying, hey, everybody, don't pay any attention to those crazy people out there, you know, people like you and me. Um, and, you know, that does tend to disillusion your, your voters. I mean, it, it, it certainly doesn't feed their intensity if that's what you're looking for. So, you know, so in any case, I think you're getting back to the debate. I certainly feel that the center of gravity in the Democratic Party is much further, I shouldn't say much further left. It is substantially left of where it was in 2008. And it's, there are certain people within the party who are running big names with a lot of, of, of active followers, you know, the Sanders and Harris and uh, Sanders and Warren, uh, for instance, who, you know, have a very strong, you know, they're holding down the left end of the, of the dial there. That, you know, this is, you can tell that something has, has happened to the Democratic Party. Now, you still see all these voices, a lot of the never Trumpers and various other, you know, moderate voices are saying, oh, no, you know, this is terrible. Look, they're, they're going to blow it and Donald Trump's going to win. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but I think it's time to have this contest. I really do. You know, I think it's time to actually put the ideas that the Democrats actually believe in, put them on the table. Let's see what happens. I mean, this is, you know, I, there's no, there is no guarantee that tacking to the right or being, you know, very overly concerned with whether or not you appear to be too left is going to beat Donald Trump. Nobody knows what's going to beat Donald Trump. He is, he is an alien from outer space in the political world. And all these people, including the Never Trumpers, go, look, you know, I've won a lot of races. Let me tell you how to win. Yeah, well, you know, we saw what happened in 2016 in their party. I'm not listening to them. And the Democrats, you know, look, we are in a different, we are in a different place than we've been with Donald Trump. Donald Trump is something unique. And, and, and I'm not talking about their ideology or anything. I'm just talking about him as a candidate. So Democrats, you know, there's nothing to go on here other than just, you know, let's just let's just go out there and tell the people what we believe in. We'll tell them what we think about Donald Trump. We'll, you know, put it put it all out there on display, and 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 try to win. I don't think there's any other way to do it because nobody knows. You can't strategize this and try and you know be too tactical and you know try and figure out where we can pick up a couple of votes over here and let's just you know pick off these. They can try it. I don't think it works in the age of Donald Trump. Well, I mean, maybe it will again I mean, let's someday. let's be honest. I don't think now. It's, I, I don't know when it has worked. Well, true. Yeah, I mean, exactly. like, when was the last time a Democratic nominee who was perceived to be the, the right person to win, but that was why they were nominated, won? Like, 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 you know, there was genuine enthusiasm for all his limitations, but there was genuine enthusiasm for Barack Obama. It wasn't yeah. like this is the guy who can win. In fact, if you were My to God. sit down and and do the, uh, the the calculation on paper, you would say this is not the guy who could win. Uh, you would you would have picked <laughs> Joe Biden, maybe or uh, yeah. or John Kerry or, you know, I mean, Michael Dukakis. I mean, the. um I, I don't know that that strategy ever works. Um, and there's no reason. And like you say, in an era of Trump, it, I think it, it it's even less workable. I mean, there needs to be, I think, just a sense of confidence, yeah, sense of confidence exactly. and exactly. that that you are not running from anything, that you're not you're equivocating. What you're offering is what you believe in rather than what you think, because half those people who walk off that stage. I'm thinking like the Hickenloopers or the Bennetts or the Delaney's. Their argument against half of the things that are talked about is like, you can't get that done in blankety blank place. But of course, they don't know that. (laughs) But it's also just sort of a lame way of backing into something. It really um, and, and there's no evidence that that is effective. You know, you got Claire McCaskill on MSNBC, you know, telling the Democrats how to win. Newsflash, she lost. She lost. And, you know, so, like, this is how you run in the state? Really? Well, then why didn't you do it? You know, like, yeah. uh, why did you fail? Uh, <laughs> and I, I don't know. I, 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 but I, I think that 
I mean, I watched this thing and I'm impressed insofar as Me too. Um, where the party has come. And I think that is, you know, largely a function of Bernie Sanders, uh, frankly. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of other factors. He was the one who just sort of stepped into that role. I think Elizabeth Warren could have stepped into that role in 2016. And I think in many respects, Sanders was waiting for her to do that. Um, and, uh, and, and on some level, I think he is, in some ways, it is hurting his uh, his bid on some level because it is not as easy to look at those, you know, two debates and distinguish between him and right. the other people. I mean, I think that if you are more sensitive to the policies, it's you, you can see it more clearly, uh, you know, in most circumstances. But for a relatively casual observer um, or even not even that casual, I think it's sort of hard to say, like, there's huge amounts of daylight here. Um, well, I don't think I don't think there is. And I think that that Sanders and, and you're right, of course, he deserves tremendous credit for that. You know, he was the, the standard bearer. And we're talking about going way back, you know, not just even before 2016. And, you know, just to add to it, I think there are a couple of other factors, too, that, that should be given a little credit. One is, I think, that Occupy Wall Street uh, during the, during, you know, I mean, that was a, a gigantic, especially on the generational level. I think if you if you were growing up during the, the mid-2000s to the late-2000s, and that's, you know, you saw that. Um, that, was a, that was a spontaneous movement. It was global, and, you know, I, I'm not sure that they accomplished anything specific, but what they did was, a, it was an awakening, uh, a, you know, an epiphany, a <laughs> collective epiphany. I mean, they put income inequality into the, uh, income into the lexicon, into the, uh, in, into the national huge. discourse. I mean, there's no doubt. It, the, uh, Bernie Sanders was um, in many ways inherited something. He had always been calling for it, but he inherited, the, you know, and I think it's a function of Occupy Wall Street. I think it's a function of, frankly, um, having a, uh, you know, a generational thing where you have... The spirit uh, for the net roots. <laughs> the, and the net roots. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that conspired to this, um, but uh, he just happened to be the one who became the national figure mm -hmm. talking about these yeah. things at that time. And, and, and I think there's also sort of some, some marginal differences um, that, you know, are more or less important to different people in terms of like where he stands and in, in, in terms of a critique of capitalism. Uh, sure. But, but, but in terms of just basically, you know, the broad strokes, um, which is, I think how most people digest uh, a debate like this, um, it's harder for him to stick out. So yeah. let's, let's talk about, uh, you know, with that said, and I, you know, there, I would have liked to have seen more talk about free college and climate change, uh, during these debates and sort of having an opportunity to sort of, for people to have like laid out a bigger vision, like it, everything got very small, very quick, it felt like in both those debates. And maybe that is the sort of the danger of having, um, well, I mean, it's part of it is, is having that many people on stage at the same time. But if you had had Fox, let's say, do that debate instead of MSNBC, they would have just come out and like, how can you justify government <laughs> And then people would have had an opportunity to sort of like start with these sort of broader proclamations of, well, you know, uh, why arguing, you know, why government's good. Um, but uh, there's going to be plenty more debates. So let's let's just get a sense of what you think, how, how the race is going to change following these two mm. first debates. Um, give me your your sense of what sort of, I guess, the, well, the headlines are in that respect. I was a little surprised at how at how poorly um, Joe Biden did in the second debate. I, I had expected him to be a little bit. I mean, he's you know he's really Joe Biden. were you really surprised? Yeah, I did. Well, I was. I thought that he would be. I, I didn't think he'd get he'd get you know nailed quite as as hard as he did. I think it was a very bad showing for him. But I'm not sure it'll make that much difference. I don't know. Um, you know, he's still the front runner and, and we'll see, but I think it exposed on some level, something about him, which is number one, he's, he, you know, he's just not, he, he's, he's, 
he hasn't kept up. Let's just be be kind about it and put it that way. He's just kind of not of the moment, and I think that that it showed really, you know, for the first time, I think maybe the whole country could see that. Wow, you know, he he's he's lost a step here, and I don't I don't mean that in the ageist sense. I just mean that he has clearly not taken the time to you know fully assess and understand where the party is right now what what you know what the the you know the the morals and mores are of the democratic party and he see he had just had assumed that he was going to be crowned here i think right because he's um, an arrogant and, a-hole right i mean yeah, that's what comes yeah, across I mean, he like he's so been, arrogant by the way yes. I mean, nothing new but it this fits into the narrative where he starts to see like you know the more than anything else that bragging about being friends with the segregationists was yeah. just sort of like completely the arrogance and the sort of like shocking lack of empathy and the shocking lack of awareness. I I understand why he may have done that in the moment, like even if he didn't have some issues, you know, uh, problems in terms of race. I can understand why any politician in that era would have done that. But to look back on it in retrospect and not go... Yeah. I, you know, to express some like ambivalence about it to, you know, but to use it, you know, like I can see saying like, you know, 30 years ago I had to cavort with people who today I don't even think I could even shake their hands. Like, you know, to say something like that, you know, even if it was insincere, even if he didn't believe it would at least have an awareness of like, Hey, um, Things in terms of race have progressed <laughs> and exactly. we, it's no longer even remotely accessible, you know, acceptable to he could have celebrated it. Right. Yeah. I was the vice president to the first black president. And let me tell you, when I started out, I had to hang around with some people and work with them that you wouldn't even believe they were in the Democratic Party even, you know. And yeah. and this is what we had to do just to make the slightest amount of progress. And look how far we've come. We, that doesn't even exist in our party anymore. I mean, it could, he could have turned it into a positive for himself. And instead, you know, he's proud of this. And, you know, this what this speaks to is this delusion on his part. And I, I think he truly believes it, that when, if he becomes president, he can, you know, he can go in and cajole Mitch McConnell and, you know, whoever into doing his bidding because, you know, they'll all be buddies. They've known each other for years. And this is just the worst fallacy. I mean, I thought the Obama administration believed that in the beginning. And they were schooled, hardcore over the first term, and they, they wised up. By the second term, they, they understood what they were dealing with. Where was Joe? Did he not see any of that? I mean, did Ryan, he just think that that was just, I mean, what, what happened there? Was he asleep? I don't get it. Ryan Grimm has a great uh, piece in The Intercept. I think he's excerpted from his book, or at least based upon the research he did from his book, about about the, the fiscal cliff and how yeah. Biden uh, went around Harry Reid. Harry Reid had wanted to go over the cliff because... I know you remember this, but people may not remember that the Bush tax cuts had to sunset within 10 years because they were passed through reconciliation. So this fiscal cliff basically was like if the Democrats do nothing, if they basically went home for vacation at the end of the year, then all of the Bush tax cuts would have been rescinded. It would have obviously given the Democrats all the power. They could come back if they wanted to uh, give, you know, gives, you know, um, re-institute middle-class tax cuts. Uh, They could have done that. They could have owned that. And the the power position, like, you couldn't possibly want, ask for a better situation in terms of, like, where you get, because you didn't have to do anything. It was a runaway train. And you could just sit there and say, like, if the Republicans don't want to stop this train, that's fine because it's going to stop. It's just going to stop at the spot, spot we want it to spot, stop. And then we're going to leverage that and, and get what we want. Right. And, and the, the Republicans have to go around. And Joe Biden stepped in. I, and, and I don't know if it's ideological or just sort of like some type of ego thing or just some type of notion like I'm going to own this. Uh, I'm going to give them. I mean, it's like literally like somebody comes up to goes like, I want to buy that bicycle of yours. And you say, okay, uh, $80. And they go, hmm, I don't know. And Joe Biden goes, I'll resolve this. I'm a good, <laughs> I'm a good negotiator. You could have the bike for $40. <laughs> and they go, great. And he comes, ah, I see that. It's called deal making. <laughs> I mean, 
Who does that remind you of? I mean, and I hate to say this because it's not really fair to Joe Biden because he's not like Donald Trump. But I got to say that I see way too many parallels. There is Um, an arrogance and there is a mindset that I think is anachronistic now. And uh, and I think that's the the idea is that we can we can, uh, you know, beat uh, Donald Trump with Donald Trump light. Yeah. Well, again, we're we're t- talking about that idea that oh, well, we just need to, you know, we need to p- appeal to some of those Trump voters, you know. And look, there are Trump voters you can appeal to. In fact, I wrote a piece this week about the Never Trumpers, and I, I've been really, I'm not a Never Trump basher, you know, a Never Trumper basher. I tend to sort of enjoy some of them. They you know they're very, you know, clever and often have a lot of great insults for Donald Trump. So, you know, I, I'm not one to say, you know, hey, don't join us because of all the horrible stuff you did before like me uh, my feeling I'm is sort we'll, of a little bit like that but, i know no, but no. I, my feeling is bring them on board we'll work with them you know this is this is us you know we're we're, we're gonna gonna ally with stalin here and then after it's all over we'll we'll <laughs> we'll go back to our to our uh right yeah and we'll revisit all this but in any case that's beside the point what 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 they've been saying you know is that you know you just can't you know you can't be all left-wing or whatever and i'm going Look, you, you, you people don't understand. There is one group that may be gettable for the Democrats, and, and they're only gettable on one level, which is that you know, they, they, they are appalled by Donald Trump's assault on the Constitution and, and political norms. They're not gettable on policy. Come on, they're Republicans. They're gettable on that, and the Never Trumpers have an argument to make to those people that Donald Trump is you know, a sui generis, right? He's somebody who is doing this in a way that nobody has done before, but many will do after him if they're allowed to get away with it. This goes to impeachment and various investigations, oversight, all that stuff. They have that argument to make. Um, that's where the, those people are. And those people are those you know, suburban white women and college-educated Republicans who are gettable. They're not gettable on policy. So, you know, you can you can talk about all this that, you know, they've got their own issues there with the, you know, they love the tax cuts. They love all the crap that Trump does. But if they think he's destroying the Constitution, they may be gettable. But that's not an argument that can that is going to be easily made by Democrats. That's something these never Trump people can make. And, you know, maybe they could put their their talents to better use, let's say, than giving Democrats advice on what policies they should have right. uh, to appeal to Republicans. Um, you know, and this is sort of, you know, this is, again, you know, shaving off on the edges, this idea that, oh, you know, we can just if we just do a little bit of tweaking here with our with this policy and let's not go too far left because that will offend the Republicans. You know, that's not how this is going to work, I don't think. I think they're, they're, you know, that we're just in a whole new world and, you know, let it – the politicians with the best instincts will win. And I'm telling you, I don't think that Joe Biden has them. No, I agree. I don't think they're there. And, I, you know, there were some others who came came out, you know, I think that shown in the in the debates that kind of gave themselves a, an opportunity for a second look, like obviously Harris did very well last night. She was very aggressive with, with Biden, which I think sort of showed people, you know, these are all kind of beauty contests, right? There's right. only so it's just too many people. So what you want to see is sort of a sign of character or cleverness or some ability to sort of seize the spotlight or whatever. There, it, it's, a, it's theater, right, more than politics. And she was very, very good at the theater and showed, I think, which is something that a lot of people are longing to see, is somebody who is, um, has, has a, 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 the political ability, perhaps, to go up against Donald Trump. And and in this kind of situation, I think that she did show that. She showed that she has a, a, a talent for it. And she, she, we've seen it before. She did it in the hearings yep. with um, with Bill Barr, you know. I mean, so she, she's good at that, and that will that will stand her in good stead going forward. I, th- I thought she was really effective. And, of course, you know, I mean, I personally, my own, and I am saying this to everybody, just, you know, you, my biases are right out here on my sleeve. I am, you know, I adore Elizabeth Warren. I have for many, many years. She's been a major favorite of mine. So I was, you know, very happy to see her do well in the first debate. Yeah, I thought she did well. What else? Uh, so uh, Harris uh, uh, and uh, Warren, I think uh, Bernie did okay. Um, I don't know that he won any new converts. I don't know that he... I, I suspect that it doesn't impact him much either way, but he probably gains on some level uh, to the extent that Joe Biden loses. Right. Um, and um, who else? Anybody else that you think is going to be um, 
that 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 did well that it's going to get any yes, more attention? I mean, surprisingly, I thought that Kirsten Gillibrand did well. I mean, she's been a cipher in this race so far. But you know, last night she sort of pushed her way into the debate, and she it wasn't so much her delivery or the theater of her, but I thought she said some things that were that were pretty effective. I don't know if anybody heard it because you know no one was really paying attention to her. I thought I thought she. Uh, she was pretty good, and I, you know, I, I thought that uh, that um, you know Pete Buttigieg, he's not you know someone on policy that I'm particularly attracted to at the moment, but he's a gifted, uh, you know, rhetorical yeah. speaker. I mean, he's really, really good, and I expect that we're going to see more of him. Yeah, you know, he, he's he's, he's good. sort of scares me a little bit. Um, yeah, me too. But I'm saying, I'm just saying, he's talented. Yes, I think that's. I think that is. Yes, the 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 reality is you cannot deny this guy has skills. Um, yeah, and uh, that's what's so scary about him in some in, in, in many <laughs> respects. Um, but all right, well, uh, Heather, um, thank you so much. Have a great week. Have a great you fourth, too. and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. Thanks Bye-bye. for having me. All right, folks. <laughs> We're going to take a very quick break. And then, in studio, we have no music, but it'll be old Matt will be joining us. Um, Of course, new Matt is here, so I don't know if maybe what will happen is they'll cancel each other out. There can only be one. It's like Highlander. It's like... uh, There's a lot um, more than one Matt. Matter and anti-matter. There's a lot there, I think. Mm. I'm tired, folks. So tired. All right, uh, so give us uh, one minute, and when we come back, Matt Bender will be here.
Um, one of the uh, upsides of, of listening to this show is that uh, you get to hear the interstitials, and now um, Matt has old, uh, excuse me, new Matt has um, gone back to his roots, which was, what was the name of your podcast when you first came? Uh, Informationer. Informationer, which was taking tapes, Nixon tapes, maybe some LBJ tapes, and putting mood music underneath it. And I remember you coming in for your... Uh, for your, for your interview saying, yeah, I did this to get my friends to listen to uh, these tapes. And I thought, well, maybe we have found, because there's two things I look, uh, you know, to, to replace people who have gone. One is like a skill set, and then the other is uh, someone who has the same name. <laughs> that way I don't have to learn the new person's name. And uh, so um, when Matt, when you came in, and uh, told me about yourself. I was impressed with your skill set, but I was really sold because I was so used to saying Matt around the office that I wasn't going to have to change. And with us now is the reason why I developed that habit. That is Matt Binder. Well, hello. Matt Binder, welcome back. Oh, it's great to be back. It's only taken, oh, geez, how many years? <laughs> yeah, four years. <laughs> Matt is... Right. Good, good way you land your opening. Right. Like that. Yep. Wait, has it been Straight four be years? It's been four years since I've been gone from the show. I did, I did. I was a guest on the show early, early last year for like a 10-minute segment where I just called in. But other than that, I have not been on this show since the last day I worked here, back in October of 2015. That's nuts. You know, someone... It's tough to hear. You know, what's funny is like I went to... I had a doctor's appointment uh, yesterday... And uh, he told me, like, I'm coming up close on my colonoscopy. And I'm like, no, we just had that. Because I remember sitting here <laughs> complaining with you guys about my health insurance uh, coverage yes. on my colonoscopy. And I realized, like, wait, that was four years ago? Right. Yeah. yeah. It feels very recent. You know, I hate to uh, quote Mike Cernovich, but time really has dilated. <laughs> If you're going to quote him, quote him pro properly. Right. So, Matt, what have you been doing? You've been been um, you've been you've basically creating spawns? Yeah, yeah. I've got... Well, when I left here, I had one kid. Right. And now I have two. Wow. Ooh. Now, how did that happen? <laughs> well, the way these things usually work, <laughs> I don't know if you quite know. No, no. You take but, Ambien and then what? Right, right, right. That's that's part of it, I guess, if you're right. not me. Right. <laughs> Now, Matt, of course, is a straight edge. Still I am straight still edge? straight edge, right. Wow. In fact, when I came in here and someone uh, said, whoa, Matt, look at that Red Bull you have. I said I, to myself, I was like, I don't have a Red Bull. And then I realized it was this Matt, because I'm the one who usually had the energy drink in this studio. Wait, can right. you not drink Red Bull? Oh, I can. Oh, okay. I was about to no, say. No, I'm, I'm saying oh, that I thought. Oh, got it, got okay, it, got yeah, it. Okay. okay. Maybe, Michael, a little bit slow still, I said. Maybe you drank right. the Red Bull because you were uh, <laughs> hungover. <laughs> What's well, that? No, no, I just literally, that's my... That's what I need for... That's his only vice. Yeah. Breakfast. Oh, I see. Yeah, caffeine and whatever else is in there. Well, right? that was the other thing, is I wanted... Uh, I I was... When I wanted to replace you, I wanted someone with the same name right, and the right. same uh, eating habits. Right. And it, we got pretty close. Uh, he has like M&Ms for breakfast. Ah, sounds, that sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, you've had uh, a, a, your a second child. Right. Um, and um, you went on to uh, Cafe Media, and now... You have your own show. Right, I do, yes. Doomed. Doomed, right. And I'm also a reporter at Mashable. There you go. Right. But yeah, doomedpod.com. Uh, that's where you could listen to the audio version of the podcast. And then youtube.com slash Matt Binder for the live stream version of the show. And I assume you have a Patreon? I have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash Matt Binder. Thank you, Sam. Uh, <laughs> I only ask for $5 a month, much cheaper than some other shows. Wow. All right. <laughs> Michael's reacting neutrally to that. Double, that was a double shot. That was, a, that was uh, me and this one. Listen, uh, there are people on well, the show you know, who claim look, to be socialists, you, and then look, there are the yeah. real uh, socialists. Right, there you go. Wow. <laughs> uh, hey, look, just because you're socialist doesn't mean that you don't, you know, pay for value. All right. All right. All right. I don't, I'm not sure. All right. <laughs> um, you know, actually, that was uh, that reminds me, because Destiny said, like, um, do, is... Uh, Michael Brooks is much uh, more to the left of you. And I said, I don't know if that's the case. Do you think that's the case? Oh, yeah, I'm to the left of you for sure. In what, in what areas? 
in redistribution and decommodifying the economy and foreign policy. I'm to the left of Just you. I don't know. Well, I don't maybe know in how foreign policy, but but what and what what do you want to decommodify and redistribute that I would? I mean, basically, ultimately everything, which I don't think you want to. The oh, show for one. So you want no private property? Well, I want private property at any. I mean, do you agree with like? I don't mind if somebody owns like uh, their own house right. or something like that. I agree, but I don't want any large corporate concentration of anything. So you're for breaking up all in all sectors? I didn't realize that. Breaking up all in all sectors? You mean from like an antitrust standpoint? No, 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 no. This is another like making them actual public commons. Not antitrust, public so like commons. Get, get more specific with what... Okay, Matt, just hold on for All a right, second. sure. Yeah, I no appreciate problem. you being here yeah. for this. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, I'm just his left wing. No, God no, I'm just, cu- I'm just curious. Like uh, because Judge I, Brandeis? I will say the line between social democrat and democratic socialism is a bit blurry. Well, that's what I think too. Not but really. I'm, but I'm, but but I, but I'm, I'm, I am curious about because it, it was the first time I thought I was like, well, Jamie well, is a co- uh, anarcho-communist, and I think that's pretty, pretty definitive. But like, what, what, uh, like, give I me actually an example dropped the about. anarcho prefix after our communization oh. episode. Oh, um, they convinced wow. me I can just be a communist now. Small C communist. There we go. <laughs> All right, but what? So what? what so would you make as an example? Well, as an example, your your interest in solving the crisis of Silicon Valley is antitrust. And I'm more interested in making these companies public utilities, as an example. So you would make uh, Google yeah, and I Facebook public utilities? Yes, absolutely. How would you deal with like First Amendment questions? You, that would, they would you covered under the First Amendment. That's how I deal with it. Okay. I'm less freaked out about that than you are. A little but, bit so awkward that's now. Me, so but, I'm um, more, that's where I go. I'm more interested in how can things actually be democratized and moved into a commons than just broken up by since, old trust busting methods. Since leaving this show, I've become a libertarian. <laughs> uh, a little bit of a surprise, I know. Wow, but, uh, I'm really angry at Sam. <laughs> and what was the other thing that you would decommodify? Uh, I would also all natural gas and oil. Oh, companies. refineries! I've been on that, on that for for years. I okay. will. Say, I you want to make you want to make those commons, not just like you want. Like I think the government tomorrow would should go to that. Exxon. Yeah, okay. I would nationalize okay, the the refineries. The I've been saying that for well, not for just refineries. The five entire or six company of say Exxon or Chevron needs to be publicly absorbed and then probably basically disassembled because it's incompatible with I, yes Earth. i would I, okay. yes i have no problem with that i mean i, I think i'm and i guess Matt, i would include for foreign policy I'm, just I'm, relax i feel like andrew yang over here yeah. <laughs> that's <the> apt <laughs> but i think that i am yeah i mean and then if we include foreign policy i'm to, i mean he said so left of you is that the quibble I'm to the left of you. I don't know that I'm so left of you. Yeah, I okay. mean, I think yeah. uh, I, I, the I think the, the 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 big difference. I mean, on foreign policy, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I, I, I would imagine tension. Maybe just just amount of energy put into yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will say this: in this Chapo UBI. Facebook group I am in, yeah. Michael has more of the left wing cred than you do, Sam. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, he's definitely. It's it's. I think he's definitely uh, branded himself in that way. I right. was just curious from <laughs> a right. Right. from a from a from well, an actual policy down. level. I will two, say, bo- two dope boys recipes. When I first <laughs> found out about the majority report. I was getting kind of a liberal vibe from you, Sam. And then the more I watched it, the more I realized that a, most, a lot of the differences that I had perceived between you and like Chapo were like affect. I definitely think that. Sam was like, okay, look, I support socialism, but first let me explain why Nancy Pelosi is so clever. <laughs> <laughs> I think She's that's true. So I think good that's true. In her Affect. leadership job. So now, where are you now, Matt? Where are you on this, uh, uh, Matt uh, Binder, old Matt? Right. Um, where Where have you landed? Because I I cite you a lot about like the online stuff, and I know that's what you're doing with Doom. But but where where are you in this? Right. I'm I'm Yang Gang. I'm a holy <laughs> with uh, <laughs> the four channers and believe that I want my one thousand dollars a month and let the world burn. No, I probably actually. <laughs> If now, he now said that, 1K a month and let the world burn, he would be a lot more fun. That's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, now that Jamie's dropped the anarcho thing, I'm probably more along uh, her, uh, her, her line of uh, thinking, to be honest. You know, mm-hmm. wait, it, non-anarcho? It was a long road, but I acknowledge the need for some form of central planning, which means I'm not anarcho. Right. right. I, I was, uh, you know, to, to take a line from against me, I was a teenage anarchist. But now I've sort of, uh, you know, that's where I've landed. Same as Jamie there. Um, I have cited you 
multiple times, as recently as yesterday on uh, on this uh, segment I did with Destiny, um, for, uh, uh, you know, back in the day when uh, Saul was about to be born, or maybe it was right after he was born, uh, I wanted to take a, you know, paternity leave. That's where, that was the genesis of Matt and Michael Mondays. And uh, I just remember you coming up to me uh, like every, you know, uh, once in a while and saying like, I want to get somebody on from men rights activists or this guy, this, um, what, 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 uh, Paul Elam? No, yeah, oh but God. what was the other guy? What Mr. was the name? Rinder. I'm just talking the general name of like uh, Paul Pickup Artists. Uh, right, and, right. But then, and there's like an acronym for him too, like P- PUA. PUA's. Yeah, PUAs. And I'm like, what the f- are you talking about? <laughs> and, 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 and I just remember saying, like, dude, you can do it if you want. Like, game, gamer, gate, what? <laughs> you can do it if you want, but that's not politics. And then I, you know, talk about like, and then three years later, they're literally in the White House. Right. Um, but, um, and that is to a large extent your beat, right? Like, right. you, um, uh, on Doomed, and are you not doing, uh, um, uh, public shaming anymore are you well no that's not going right now but it's sort of the same thing where i you know i, I go at someone on the right who deserves uh, some shaming you know we on the show we cover we cover everything really but the the like you said the bread and butter is you know what the right wing's up to uh what white supremacists are doing online uh what the you know the gamer gators and the men's rights activists and the 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 subgroup of those guys that are big now are are incels what they're all up to and, and you know, the ways they're sort of still so ingrained in, in everything that's going on in our politics. Uh, I do think in certain ways, some people like Cernovich have sort of lost their allure and their, their, their power that they once had. But that's just because that's happening to the sort of celebrity grifters who, who try to use this and buoy their own sort of career and make money off of this. But like the real true believers of these sort of groups, like, you know, the inset, like th- there's been shootings literally that have happened where people have come out and committed acts of violence and then they go online and you go online and you say, oh, they did this because they're part of the incel community and they wanted to attack women who they, who they call Stacy's because they uh, believe that they have hurt them in their lives by not having sex with them. Why, what's, what, why Stacy? It's just this dumb shit. The, the, the muscly guys you who know they Chad. perceive. Oh, How do you Chad even know the, about Chad oh, and Stacy? I didn't know. I knew about Chad because of Chad Vigorous. I didn't know right. about Stacy's. Okay, got so, it. So so they're just Stacey they're erasure. just like basic like Barbie and Ken, Always. but they've decided right. to call them Chad, Chad and, and Stacy. Stacey. Like right. what was the genesis of that? Like how do these memes? Chats. I mean, I guess it's like basically asking like a comedian like how do you come up with these ideas? <laughs> but but uh, do, do do people chase these memes down to their their like original origins right right you know a lot of the times with these things like with with gamergate there was just one thing that happened in like the gaming community and it just so happened that this woman was making independent games and her boyfriend broke up uh, she broke up with her boyfriend and he wrote this horrible screed about her and passed that around and in that thing it suggested that she had cheated on him with five different guys in the gaming community or whatever and that literally created this sort of anti-women right-wing reactionary backlash against all these really innocent people who did nothing wrong to have their lives upended and harassed the way they were and and that's literally what just kicks off these things there's just a moment where like a bunch of these people get together on reddit or on 4chan and they're like let's do something to troll and that inevitably brings out people who are like uh yeah i'm trolling but also I believe that. That's real to me. That's what's really going on. It's like the, 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 like the whole racist troll thing where like, you know, I'm just, you know, the things I'm saying, well, Pepe is just racist because it's funny, but also I am actually racist for real, right. you know? Well, it is interesting to sort of like all of these things basically come out of like these single acts of misogyny or uh, racism. Right, right. Like, right. like, you know, you got dumped, dude grow up right you don't go and you know uh it's it's just some type of uh, veiled or not veiled uh, misogyny that that drives something like that um so uh is there a sense of like where are these movements relative to where they were let's say three or four years ago like my sense is is that there is a waning on some level and i'm not I, i i only know that I, I have no sense of if that's just because of my 
personal myopia or no? Well, it's definitely been waning in certain aspects and in other aspects, it's actually, actually been growing. I think, you know, to the, the original, uh, original like groups of people who were in these, these, these different right wing groups, they sort of viewed Donald Trump as a, a disappointment in their eyes. However, their, uh, their, what they've been saying has permeated through to the Trump true believers, the you know the moms and dads, the grandpas and grandpas, the boomers who just love Donald Trump and think he's fantastic. And you see this with QAnon, how QAnon went from a 4chan slash 8chan meme where a bunch of people were just sharing this stuff on there to literally you have people in their 60s showing up at Trump rallies wearing where we go one, we go all QAnon t-shirts. Wait, and where does that one come from? What's that? Where we go one, that we is, go all? That is that is literally the QAnon catchphrase. Oh, okay. All right. It makes complete sense, right? You naturally, that sounds like very natural English. It sounds like right? a super great right catch right very brand very dope boys tested catch phrase. right right yes so so you know you you see this is growing like you go to any you look at any any trump rally there's q on shirts q on signs people saying where we go on we go all uh, you go online there's people who really do still believe that any moment now Mueller's about to pop out with trump ha arms around each other saying we just took down the deep state together and fooled you all it's a joint press conference right. john podesta's in handcuffs right we stopped child molestation <laughs> right folks. we did it Hillary, come out here. <laughs> Hillary, if you could please we come out. We have smoked out the... Hillary, is there right. anything... Great. Would you like to apologize to the victims no, of no, Comet Pizza? No, it's, oh, I, she's part of it? Yeah, she's part of it. I just want to say, like, really the hardest she, part of this whole thing... To be part of it? Not in QAnon, but you know what? If that's where the storyline uh, went, where if Q one day just came out and said that, oh, actually, I just got word that Hillary's part of this, they would then believe this. I know. I just want to say, the hardest to part of all of this like was to lock her up. Every time I had to say that, it hurt me inside. But but she was so great about it. We you know what's funny? In, in uh, Ryan Grimm's book, one of the one of the tidbits, you know, is that uh, is that Hillary Clinton actually needed to be checked by her staff to not praise Trump for firing Comey. Which I love. <laughs> oh my God. She really wants to come out and be like, co-sign. <laughs> uh, all right. So let me ask you this. What, is your sense that um, give me a sense of like how much of these movements have been hurt by essentially cutting off the heads. Like how much has it impacted to have um, the deplatforming of Alex Jones? Cernovich, um, bless his heart, seems to have not recovered from uh, the defeat at the hands of me. Right. Uh, because, always always going to be a little bit jealous well, of that one. I mean, <laughs> what happened to Cernovich, which I really think really sort of deep sixed him, was after... Um, we publicly humiliated him and then had the opportunity to publicly humiliate him again after he failed to get me fired. Who's laughing now, Sam? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> my, my, my recommendation would be to, to people who are going to troll to give it a couple more days before you really start to spike the football uh, in those situations. <laughs> my sermon, .com. But after he did that, I don't know if people remember this, he got rat effed. Somebody gave him fake documents right. that showed that Chuck Schumer had done something wrong. And he went out there with them as, a, as basically a way, I think, of distracting from him taking this beating. And I should say, I don't think too much people paid attention to that dynamic. But with him, it's all encompassing. So I think like for as far as he was concerned, his entire world was falling apart at that right. moment. And this was going to be his lifeline. And that fell apart. And then I think that really deep sixed him right um and now he's come back as some type of like a uh, documentary filmmaker he's right and sort of like he, he was you know what his his movies are on like amazon prime and shit someone needs to do something about that well it's super easy to yeah. get well, to have that happen all right actually. well you know amazon prime has taken down uh, anti-vaxxer documentaries so yeah. well so much for the tolerant left but right right but right um, but he, I think, is uh, Milo has fallen by the wayside. Well, I think with that, what you Gavin see is Gavin McGinnis. I mean, they've that lost a lot. Really good. There's been a lot of deplatforming, right. and I wonder has that impacted the movement? Well, for the superficial people like Milo, who never real ha really had any sort of movement behind him, it was just he went out there, said something provocative on Twitter, and got attention for it, and that's what sort of lifted him up amongst that audience. That's why when he got deplatformed, it hurt him so much. There was nothing really behind Milo. There was no one who actually supported Milo Yiannopoulos. It was just, haha, that guy owned the libs, that's great. 
But I think someone like Alex Jones, like undoubtedly he got hurt by being deplatformed, but he definitely still has his audience. He definitely still has sway with that world. Um, I mean, to me, there was nothing that showcased just how he knows how to still play the game than when Laura Loomer went on there crying about how she got banned from Facebook. And Alex Jones had to say, well, well, calm down, Laura. What you got to do is you got to use this in your favor. Oh, like he knew play that video. Like, it's so he, good. Yeah, like Laura Loomer's on air, bawling, screaming, and crying. Like they ruined me, Alex. They that ruined me. My it's life ruined. is ruined. And Alex is Alex Jones is telling someone to calm down. You're gonna calm need to down, think in long term a little bit. But what about the uh, like the aspect of it where the, the original dynamic? Because I think you also see this in in Europe a lot. Like I know Steve Bannon is not a, he's different than these people, but he's adjacent. And he's amazing at generating press attention. But the truth is, like, his actual particular contributions to the far right in Europe failed pretty much entirely. Right. His parties he was most closely aligned with uh, did poorly. But then, like, Salvini, who's basically the most powerful politician in Italy, uh, there's this clip that went around that Axios shared that embarrassed Bannon because Bannon's there like, ah, oh, Salvini, blah, blah, blah. And Salvini's like an Italian. He's like, yeah, I don't really know that schmuck. I've met him once or twice. Right. And everybody's <laughs> laughing and it's like, yeah, but Salvini is literally a neo-fascist and right. one of the most important politicians in Europe. So like, what is that line of like, okay, these people are less relevant but now all of these major parties are like in their image. Right, right. You and know? like Bolsonaro and well, Trump, I mean, right, and, Bo right. and Bolsonaro, like Trump, merges it. I mean, Bolsonaro right. is a foreign minister who talks about cultural Marxists. Right. Well, last week on Doomed, uh, we had uh, Michael Edison Hayes of Southern Poverty Law Center's Hate Watch on the show. And he basically was... Totally unfair group. <laughs> he, <laughs> he basically uh, wrote this great piece about... This character in Russia, this mysterious fascist, uh, his pseudonym is Alexander Slavros. And he basically created this neo-Nazi forum called Iron March. And they were like the legit neo-Nazis on, on the internet. Like this wasn't like, you know, Stormfront or the Daily Stormer where like, you know, they obviously are scary, but they're just a bunch of losers memeing online. They have no real power. Like Iron Watch are the people who are... They're, they were actually the people who uh, inspired that whole, those skull bandanas that fascists wear when they march in the streets all over the world. And that came from Iron March. And then all of a sudden, one day last year, Iron March completely falls off the internet. It wasn't the platform. No host came out and said, we took it down because it got some sort of attention. And Slavros, this guy who led this forum, completely disappears as well. And the belief there, now no one knows for sure where this guy went and what happened, but the belief there is that he actually is the son of some sort of important Russian diplomat who found out what was going on and said, you got to cut this out. We can't have this going on. And I mean... So somebody got sent to sent to his room, right? Without so uh, I think you that's grounded, right. no internet for, right. for, for you know right. ten months. So I bring that no up to basically money. say that I think what you see is that like you know a lot of a this lot of grounding. It's going a on. lot of just young people who are who could be cut off like that i mean the real problem is when this stuff as w you say when uh this stuff is now in the white house is when the grown-ups listen to these kids and say oh that's a pretty uh that's a pretty good idea and i see it's getting some some attention so let's let's pick it up and run with it as well what what has happened to breitbart like right. uh, you know like we don't ever mention breitbart as a publication anymore and i wonder if it's not like you know when bannon left um, there, there, there just seems to be a lack of synergy now between these movements and, and Breitbart, which, you know, in the election had more people were supposedly sh showing, sharing Breitbart articles on Facebook than they were like the New York times. Right. And, um, you know, it's interesting because all of this is Breitbartian. Breitbart used to run around arguing that politics is downstream from culture. And uh, so they go out there. They try and create the culture. Uh, uh, yesterday, I did an interview, another one that we're going to run soon. It was downstream with, with, from an ambulance. With, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. with Caleb uh, <laughs> Kane, who was the subject of that New York Times piece. And, um, you know, for him, it was like sort of the how-to culture. Like, that's how he ended up getting sort of sucked into that alt-right world. Right. Um, 
and uh, you know self help uh, stuff. You could have right, found that you know, found that from books just as easily. And I think that's really what a lot of it is when it comes down to it. Like you have the true believers, the people like Slavros, who is the anonymous guy from Russia. You have your, you know, your uh, your Nathan Domingo, who was the uh, the guy who ran uh, all those uh, those patriot protests over in the West Coast. You have your Richard Spencers, the true believers who legitimately believe this stuff. And then you have the bulk of the audience, the bulk of that movement, which I really do believe is young men, white men, who fall into this stuff on YouTube, and they are just lost, they can't find a job, and they latch onto this shit. Now, I'm not saying that gives them a pass, but I think you know there's a lot of those people who just need to be shown in the right direction. So Marianne Williamson's good then. We I need self-help I'm, for the I, left. I'm a big Marion Williams. I'm not even, I mean, oh, yeah, I'm slightly being tongue-in-cheek uh, about great. her, but I don't think, <laughs> I actually think you can't give up the terrain of people's <laughs> well, interest in no, self-improvement to the right. Well, I, I, yeah. I, I, I just trying, think that there's probably I mean, a little bit more, we can we can put a little more I mean, meat at, on that bone. Look than, at uh, Jordan yeah, Peterson. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's well, his whole No, I agree. I mean, I'm not saying that self-help is not a good way to enter into that. I would have just gone with something a little bit less ethereal uh, in the self help. Oh yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan yeah. of that. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm not a fan of that whole. I, I I agree with what you're saying. I know you're a bit more of a you know hippy dippy than uh... hippy dippy. <laughs> no, I but, mean uh, you know whatever. She she didn't do herself many favors. But honestly, like she didn't do it, anybody many favors. She brought up Central America in the context of immigration and reparations. I I'll don't give her think some that's points. going to help. Actually, um, I think oh, whatever. when it's a if, doesn't help if Julian Castro she did, uh, she did, she did, brought it she did up. Fine. She, uh, to me, she actually, my, favorite, Marshall plan my for, favorite line from her well, actually I was when Buddha Judge was interrupting means. Bernie and she says to Buddha Judge, just because you're young doesn't mean you have don't have old ideas. And I was like, oh, that's true. It's true. Perfect. Totally true. He is the reincarnated corpse of Hillary Clinton in the body of a gay millennial. Right. Yes. Right. Um, the. It's it's going to be just curious, I guess, to see where that Breitbart where that goes. If that re it gets in reinvigorated in the election, because it seems to me without sort of like cross medium validation, these things have trouble right building up some type of steam. Right. I, I do wonder how I mean, it definitely was a part of Breitbart's fall from grace, but I do also wonder how much. Just how every I feel like every election cycle, every presidential race, there's always that one new internet news outlet that just takes off and then sort of flutters after. I mean, mm. Huffington Post isn't maybe the greatest example, but they were huge in 2008 with Obama and Sarah Palin. And, you know, I, I would argue they probably never were. They still are big, but they never really had that. Well, they sold to right. AOL. Right. They got subsumed. She left. And then A lot of the people left. They, they started to cut back on the funding. 2016, 538, and Nathan Silver's word was gold. Anything that they put out... Oh, that's what's going to happen, you know. Oh, hashtag unfollow Nate Silver. Seriously. God, oh, he's awful. And P.S. Shout out to Breitbart for using a really cute picture of me for all your loser readers to cry debate to. <laughs> Okay. Christ debate is the first time I've heard that term. I've never heard that one either. It uh, won't be the last. <laughs> I, I don't know why it's taken this long for me to hear that because right, right. I enjoy that term. Right, something. Um, so, all right. So, uh, this entire party what, if you here. had to predict. What is going to, is there a gamer gate that is like floating around out there? Is there some type of like dynamic that you can say, you know, uh, six months from now, Sam, you're going to be dealing with this stuff? Right, right. I, I think the QAnon stuff is held for way longer than most people would have thought it did. Wow. And I don't think it's dropping off. I think it's actually just growing. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I is think, it like, like I think the next event? step is literally for just Donald Trump to outright say something that literally is a direct like n nod of the hat to them. Like it's just that close to it. I like, thought he's done that. He he's he's basically not really done that. Oh. They just interpreted different things as that. Like the whole literal movement is. Is there a hand gesture? There there's not Did a they, hand they, gesture. They, they, like no. that's what I feel no. like they need. No. They need well, a hand they, gesture. They, they, there needs to be like a well that Q. well that not this thing which is the whatever it is right. the white power. But there right. needs to be like a you know. A cue, like a, just, right. someone's just going like an no, extended cue. Just, <laughs> right. I don't know how. Hello. He, well, a lot of you know a lot of the the four channers and the the internet trolls. They've been uh, really big fans of Andrew Yang, and they've been really. I'm not even saying directly that's his fault. It's more like like anything. He's not a white supremacist. Can I say it's so where he's in, fishing, though. In but his, it's 
Listen, it's, it's little, question, you okay. could you could directly trace that big boost in 4chan support for Andrew Yang from him going on Joe Rogan. And I hope Joe Rogan's listening. So uh, wait, wait, but my question <laughs> Joe Rogan just having him on that podcast grew that whole white supremacist sect that really is the, the large sect of the Yang gang. I mean, I, I don't know how is else it, to put it. Is it better though? And I done plenty of videos on both shows about not liking Andrew Yang. And I do think he's, I don't know whether it's it's intentional or he's oblivious when he he's, says He's out of his things. league. He doesn't know how to handle it. He's totally out of his league. But is it better, if I'm playing devil's advocate, is it better that you migrate some of those people over to just sort of like techno pop nonsense instead of white nationalism? Oh, yeah. Right? I, obviously, yes. Like but, if you're going to meme all day for your Yang bag versus Trump, but, but what I said, that's probably, I mean, that's objectively a net positive for the world over Trump. But what I said, though, earlier about how, you know, yeah. wanting to see the world burn and then just get my collect a thousand dollars. That's a direct reference to a lot of the former Trump supporters who are now supporting Andrew Yang. Sure. That's they wanted Trump in because they wanted to see people get hurt. And now they're supporting Andrew Yang because they feel like nothing will change. People will still get hurt, but they'll get an extra thousand dollars to blow on Steam or something like that. Some yeah. Twitch bucks to Little give their Little did they know, we'll just go to their landlords anyway, <laughs> unless they live with their parents. Fucking oh, idiots. here's Andrew Yang doing the uh, just taking a course at the Dave Rubin U. I've noticed that conservatives often follow liberals on Twitter, but the reverse does not seem to be true. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that I have the only people who block me are conservatives. And people and conservatives block me before I even go after them. True. Bunch of snowflakes. Yeah, it's unbelievable. That's why I don't follow them. Except right. Dave Rubin. He hasn't blocked any of us. Props to Dave. Thank yep. you for at least some limited courage in the battlefield of ideas. Uh. Can I ask a question of Matt? I wanted to ask sure. you, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, that the same sort of pool of disaffected, young, often white, downwardly mobile millennial men is feeding into the alt-right and kind of the DSA sphere as well. And like, what does that mean for our movement? What does that mean for trying to diversify our movement? And like... I, I've pondered this question a lot, so I'm curious what you think. Well, well, it it could go either way. It really just depends who they fall on online, and it's just it's just a fact. And I don't I, I it's there's no one reason, but it's a fact that if you go on YouTube, the most politics sort of commentary and coverage you'll come across is from right wing political commentators. It's been like that since the very beginnings of YouTube. Maybe they've just been on there long enough that just their reach and them being them having that that one or two steps ahead of the left in that sense just basically gamed the algorithm to continue to push that stuff. YouTube certainly hasn't done very much until very recently to fight that to, to sort of even the the, 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 the the playing field there. But it's just a fact that people go online, and I keep bringing up YouTube because that's where this is mostly happening. People aren't going on Twitter and Facebook, young people I should say, aren't going on Twitter and Facebook and being completely swayed in one direction because there's not that rabbit hole. On Facebook, older people, yes, because on Facebook they go on there to talk to people, find their old classmates they haven't seen in forever, and they stumble upon these conservative meme pages. So you're like, I wonder what Jeff's up to. Oh my God. God, John right. Podesta's raping people. <laughs> That's on a literally place. it. That's literally it. And listen, there, there's been studies that show, and it's funny because old people are shocked when they hear these studies because they think they're so smart. Uh, but fuck off, boomers. Uh, <laughs> this is basically what studies have shown that young people are more conscious about fake news online. Oh, yeah. And older people fall for stuff immediately. Older people will see breaking news from realpatriotnews.blogspot.com.ru and they'll say, oh, this news about Hillary Clinton is absolutely true. I read it on uh, patriotnews.blogspot.com.ru. It must be true. I want to follow a Django Unchained strategy well, right. law enforcement. I mean, the, the, the reason, I think, is just because there is a lack of understanding of just how accessible this media is. There's a perception of, like, it, it's someone built a website. 
right. to do this. Right. And like there's a perception that there's a bar to entry right. that does not exist. Right. And this is why YouTube is more effective for young people because on YouTube, I mean, you just see it with, I see it with, with my son, Ezra. He's going to be four years old. He loves what? shows like Ryan's Toy Review. He connects with that. Gavin McGinnis. Gavin McGinnis. Yeah. Uh, so well, like, what is going look, on? Listen, he connects yeah. with that kid who he watches. This, kid, fa- this kid's family puts up very personal videos of him playing with toys, playing with his sisters every day and he watches these shows we've cut back but he watches these shows on a regular basis and he feels like he know he brings up ryan like we'll go to a store he'll see something he wants we'll say no and he'll say but ryan has it and it's because there's that personal connection with seeing this kid in what looks like home movies and they feel like they know this person and that's what you're seeing with youtube that you don't see anywhere else with young people they're watching these right-wing, white supremacist, neo-Nazi YouTube commentators, and they're seeing them in their basement, in their bedroom, talk to them directly to their little Logitech video cam webcams, and they're saying for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hour streams every night, saying, the immigrants are doing this to you, the left wants to take this away from you, and they're saying, oh, I know this guy, I could trust him, why would he stray me the wrong way, without realizing that this guy is getting a nice check from Google AdSense for gaining a giant YouTube subscription Subscriber base for saying these things. It's, yeah, it's like that's I mean, it's it, the the closest to the that medium is talk radio. I think. Right. I mean, in many respects, because the 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 level of the way it's ingested, the fact that it's in the background, that it almost becomes like a soundtrack for you. I mean, there are people who listen to this program and they dip in and out and they'll believe it on for two or three hours. And, you know, uh, our voices start to like sort of create some type of neuro implant, you know, uh, tr- uh, in their heads. It, it's like a parasocial. It is a parasocial relationship. Well, they, they, they also the, the, they used to be expressed that television is a cool medium and that radio is a hot medium. And I would say that YouTube is more hot medium than cool medium. Right. There is not the fourth wall. Like, you know, good talk radio, you're actually having a conversation. You're right. just doing all the talking, uh, but you're having a conversation with the audience. audience right. Television does not work that way, but YouTube does. All right. You know, it's like, hey, guys. Uh, and in that fact, you can literally have that conversation. Well, because you're also right. getting feedback. Right. You know, that is almost like similar to the call function, right? Where right. in the chat, mm-hmm. there is there is some dynamic that goes back and forth. Let me ask you this. Um, do you let Ezra do anything but watch YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> we actually, he has very limited TV time, very limited screen time, the complete opposite of me. In fact, he'll go and tell his mother, daddy's on the phone, Ma- Matt, get off the phone. Yeah. So he knows the rules and uh, maybe I need to listen to them a little bit go. more. What's his uh, favorite energy drink? We don't allow him to drink that yet. All right. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. let's, let's go over some, um, some sound clips. I mean, I, well, uh, l- lastly, let me ask you this. What do you think about YouTube and, and deplatforming and like the Crowder thing? Because this is obviously coming up a lot. I'm having a lot of conversations about this. Um, uh, Michael wants to have the U.S. government determine what is legitimate to say on YouTube, uh, determine what is considered obscene, right? That's the idea. Essentially, yes, yeah, sure. So Michael wants That's to have. That's a really, really good frame. Well, I mean, that is... I want to democratize is, these uh, companies, yes. I would like do. to have the post-U.S. government decide what can be on YouTube. Right. I would like right. to have the right. Kurdish government I, I actually, authority. I actually sort of... I'm, I, I, I sort of have the... the, the the belief that I'm not going to die on this hill. If it happens, it happens. But like, I personally don't really care what happens to Alex Jones. Like, if he didn't get deplatformed, that's fine. Like, I, I don't think it's it's a negative or a positive in terms of it's just if he wants to be on YouTube and YouTube wants him on the platform, then that's fine. Uh, it's not the hill I'm going to die. I'm not going to go out and defend Alex Jones. If he gets deplatformed, good do. He shouldn't be on there if that's what YouTube thinks. So that's sort of how, how I look at it. I think there's a, a benefit to having them on these platforms. I think there's a benefit to having them off of these platforms. You really get something and you give something either way. Um, I mean, Alex Jones literally became a, a big joke because of a lot of his more over-the-top uh, 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 words that sort of became mainstreamed. If that didn't happen, you know, back a couple of years ago, Alex Jones was literally, uh, you know, the Sandy Hook truther stuff. That was well before uh, Donald Trump made him mainstream and his 
his like his audience ate that shit up and started harassing Sandy Hook parents. Would that have happened if Alex Jones did Sandy Hook trutherism in 2017, 2018, when people were clipping Alex Jones's most ridiculous phrases and just mocking him openly? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think it would. Maybe there would still be a certain segment of people, but it certainly would have hurt his sort of cred with his own audience in and terms of the more ridiculous stuff recently just got I re- demonetized I, for yeah, no I need reason to, I need to get part better of this on broader this, right. process i i got monetized on youtube very shortly a couple of months ago uh after months of getting uh, uh getting saying sorry we can't monetize you quite yet i don't have a huge audience so i'm not losing tons of money but you know if i was a right winger online if i was you know anyone on the right I would come out and say that, and right-wingers from all over the spectrum, the Laura Loomers, the Mike Cernoviches, the Ben Shapiros, the Dave Rubens, the Jordan Petersons, they would be out there lifting me up, talking about he just got banned for sharing his conservative views, and tomorrow I'd wake up and have $100,000 in my Patreon, and I would have a million subscribers on my YouTube, and I'd be the new right-wing celebrity. But listen, I got demonetized after getting monetization, and they did not tell me why I've been demonetized. Uh, After months of being fine, giving me a couple bucks every episode, I've just been demonetized. It happened like a day or two after I had an episode where I interviewed two members of the Boston DSA who were spearheading the uh, the uh, counter protest march to that uh, big uh, Boston Straight Pride Parade march you probably heard about? Yeah. It went viral. Led by Milo, right? No, actually, it's not. Milo doesn't really have anything to do with it. He, he might have been involved. Right. No, they just had hired like him the as like the um, uh, right. the homecoming queen so or whatever. Do, do you guys remember Based Stick Man? That guy on yeah. <laughs> How could okay. we forget? No. Right. No. He, he was this. No. He was this neo-Nazi guy who basically. Over in uh, California, when there was all those Patriot prayer marches and everything, you'll remember there was all those uh, attacks between, like, you know, the the, the, uh, Antifa and the right-wingers over there in, like, Oregon. Basically, uh, this guy became famous for wearing literal, like, knight's armor and bashing Antifa people with a stick. And so they started calling him Base Stick Man, and he became some sort of, like, minor internet right-wing celebrity. And he started creating these different subgroups that were like he that he led all over the country, and basically he could no longer. I, I forgot exactly what it was that he did, but a court basically said he can't leave his state anymore. <laughs> so, so these other Boston white supremacist guys took over his group and put together the Straight Pride Parade march to try to garner some sort of support for their movement without their former leader, Base Stickman. Huh. And I, that's, that's basically. But I just, I just think it's I, really interesting. How can we arrange this. for a massive, massive flood where all of us <laughs> just get the, we just it's all in? Right. See, yeah, getting yeah, on right, board right. with Posadism. But now. I think that yeah, Sam's gonna get that right. The place. funny and thing after a couple more years on Bumble, he'll be definitely be stoked about Posadism. But the, I think the, the funny thing about Bay Stick yeah. Man though is you know I might be the only person uh, on the left, not on the right, uh, to have had the Kent State Gun Girl on my show. I interviewed yeah. her on the show. Uh, I got her on the show before she was Kent State Gun Girl. When, should be demonetized. Back when she was just the Kent State poop diaper girl. Oh. Uh, she was the one who spearheaded the uh, Turning Point USA. I don't know if you remember the diaper yes. protest. Wearing diapers to she own the lips. That? Right. Yeah. So she's, she's the one who she's the one who organized that when she was going to school there. What the hell is wrong? And then people? once everyone memed it to oblivion and trashed it to hell. Uh, they basically, the uh, you know uh, Charlie Kirk and the Turning Point USA uh, heads, basically threw her under the bus and said we had nothing to do with it. It was all her, and so she publicly left that group and wanted to shit talk about them. So I was like, by hell, I'll take anyone who's the shit nah, talk. <laughs> by the way, I, if you ever write a book, uh, meme to hell. What is it? Meme, meme to meme, meme to, to hell, hell and shit and shit talk to what? That, was, that should be your book. But so, I mean, that's just really th- interesting though, because when you when you scratch the surface of like these big top lines of some horrible person or asshole like Alex Jones or Gavin McGinnis. And you really start to look at like, even as an example, like zero books, having that uh, Ben Burgess video on Ben Shapiro in Israel completely taken down. You look at a lot of videos actually on the uh, history of apartheid uh, getting taken down or even uh, fact checker videos on white supremacist lies about land reform in South Africa. And then if you broaden this out to like Facebook, you have they're outsourcing their stuff to DC think tanks and suppressing Telesaur. So and what's funny is that if this all starts to get shut down and these platforms just become risk averse, 
not only will it disproportionately hurt the left, all of the right wing people end up still having corporate donors anyways right. to have their back. So we need to be a little more strategic about this. Right. And there, there is a legitimate, I think, a legitimate uh, uh, cause there to, to push these tech companies. I mean, beyond just push them, there's a lot more we could do. But let's just deal with where we are right now, where we we are seeing that Google, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Pinterest, uh, all these different websites are actually starting to to at least somewhat uh, speak to public pressure. I mean, you have Pinterest outright making it not possible to find anti-vaxxer stuff on their website. And you're probably sitting there going, huh, Pinterest, who gives a shit about that website? It's for Mormon moms. But exactly, that's where the anti-vaxxer community is. What's the anti-vaxxer thing the, on Pinterest? What's that? Okay, so... People so would put memes. P P People Pinterest would... is basically oh, oh. just like this image board where like, you know, middle-aged moms and even young millennial religious moms, it's really popular with that subset. I used it to go my wedding. Yeah, stuff like that, you know. It, it's very popular. stuff was at your wedding? It's very... <laughs> It's yeah, very popular to, for dessert. That was the dessert. <laughs> it's very popular with with women, and you know, with the ladies. To, to for them to outright do this with anti-vaxxer stuff completely cuts off the ability for people on Pinterest to share this stuff. Uh, you know, Facebook is starting to step up in certain ways. There's a lot more they can do. They're by far the uh, aside from maybe YouTube, probably the worst offender. Um, but you know, YouTube basically is now doing something about the algorithm that suggests videos. And for so long, basically, you would go to watch any video on YouTube and what you'd probably have to go one or two videos in before they started saying, hey, you should watch this video that questions why Building 7 fell on 9-11. Or you should uh, maybe question why uh, you believe the earth is round and not flat. And, you know, this might sound silly, but we're now seeing that, you know, a lot of these uh, old school conspiracy theories that have been around for years are just another gateway into these actually even more dangerous well, sure. in terms of everyday sort of policy and everyday issues that brings them into you know the the, the far right and, and you know the pressure that's come from you know these different journalists and the public and activists really starting to focus their coverage on these companies especially in the wake of 2016 where you know this stuff started to really affect you know, a major election uh, I think it's it's really showing that this works, and I, not to I, I will, yeah, let me do this, and that's why I think Bernie Sanders knows what he's talking about when he basically says we have to build this movement because you could have all the policies in the world, but look, none of these policies would have stopped YouTube from suggesting whatever fucking video they wanted in their algorithms. Well, but there's a movement now. I'm not saying Bernie Sanders is behind this movement, but I'm saying the idea that these movements can actually push to have things happen. And then look at Elizabeth Warren coming out and saying she wants to break these companies up. I mean, that doesn't happen in a bubble. I think this is all happening because people on the ground, whether it's journalists who, who said, hey, we should really start covering this stuff, or activists who wanted to start focusing on, hey, the internet is not just what happens online anymore. You know, we're not just, it's not just the internet. This is the real world now. We need to focus on this stuff. We need to talk about how it's affecting our everyday life. You know, I think this stuff, this movement behind this really brought us here. Yo, the, Nazis are freaking everywhere online. The, I heard the other day about a knitting website community that had to kick out the Nazis. Like, really? Right. What, what well, happened? The, the, <laughs> let me just the, the 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 policies about breaking up YouTube. I mean, you know, and, and all the antitrust stuff was in the works, anticipating Hillary Clinton actually winning that election. And, um, and there was there was a, a, a bunch of things that you saw sort of following the election that were indicative of that, like the open markets pulling off from the tournament. Uh, with Net Sheryl neutrality. Sandberg and as Treasury, that would have still been a huge struggle. Right. Well, no, no, it wouldn't have come from the Clinton administration. No, no, no. It would have come. Not. It would have come. No, the policy momentum. No, what what I'm saying yeah. though is that yeah. you could just see just. Oh, like, that's they got uh, uh, because they were at New America. They had to leave because New well, America was getting Google. That I think my guess is is that was anticipated and that was something that they anticipated so happening. They what a preemptive PR move, you think? Well, no. The idea was, I think, that there was a large movement that was m largely subterranean that was anticipating Clinton getting into office mm -hmm. and was going to simply, and I think Warren was going to lead a lot of this, uh, was going to go straight at antitrust with such force that um, it would have been the, it, it just they would have overwhelmed the attempt would have been to overwhelm the Clinton administration on this accord and to 
get targeted, the Treasury wouldn't have necessarily been the, the office that would have made that much of a difference. I mean, it would have been, you know, a, a function of what's happening with like mid-level bu bureaucrats at DOJ and at the FTC. Um, and breaking up YouTube, though, if you decoupled YouTube from Google, even at this late a date, right, should have probably been prevented in the first place. But the search function and the ad function become decoupled. You give an opportunity for other things, BitChute or whatever it is, right. uh, or Vimeo or, 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 or Twitch, if they wanted to break into that. You give them basically some measure of parity when it comes to search and when it comes to uh, um, uh, dollars. And what would happen is but all of those platforms would become less lucrative for everybody. Um, you could go cross platforms, but being censored on one right. would not have the same implications, right. but it also wouldn't have the same implications in terms of like, I'm going to go on there to, to, to watch what, what toy uh, Jimmy's playing with. And wait, who's this Gavin McGinnis? Oh, this is <laughs> right. fun. Like, you know, that wouldn't happen. Right. But all right, well, look, let's, this is a, a great conversation, but we got some uh, video to go through, uh, because we got to get out here in about 20 minutes or so. Um, Word. and, uh, let's do this old school with, uh, old Matt sitting let's in as we go over, uh, some of the videos. We let's gotta do Shapiro, right? Um, well, let's start. Yeah. Let's start with Shapiro and then we'll go back to the, um, to the, uh, the debates because this is pretty great. Um, now since you've left Matt, we, we developed a, uh, a Dropbox, uh, for encrypted um, uh, information uh -huh. for people to leak it to us. Uh, we don't talk about it lo a lot because, of course, we don't want the uh, NSA to be aware of this. I've been ignoring Laura Poitras' emails. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and, um, we you don't know, want you to gotta, hear about that shit. There's an intricate <laughs> thing that involves you got to contact us on Signal. Then we send you a Proton email uh, address. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, send you a uh, FOB, which you insert into your computer. Uh, and and then what happens is we end up finding these YouTubes of uh, of, of Ben Shapiro back on with Connie Martinson on Talks Books. Uh, this is from when? 2011. 2011. Mm. I was here then. And you were here then. I don't know how we didn't find this at that time. <laughs> yeah. But Ben Shapiro. Because I was here then. Yeah, right. Ben Shapiro. Exactly. Now the job is handled with a certain degree of competence. <laughs> And where are we picking this up from the very beginning? Oh, both. I missed the Ben Shapiro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll take this right from this top. I think. Uh, okay. I guess there was a so Ben Shapiro is, clip I this missed, both. This is uh, Ben Shapiro on talking about his book about how Hollywood is um, uh, chock full of liberals. Oh and really God. what I, the most interesting thing I found about this was that Ben Shapiro, like everybody else who came from Breitbart, was just mad that they did not have talent enough to break into Hollywood. And I should shout out some more news. Cody Johnston, who uh, initially uh, included part of this who in knew? his recent Ben Shapiro video. Who knew he yeah. wanted to just ride a lethal weapon vehicle? Exactly. Yeah. By the way, Connie ends up being very cool. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. Laughing she owns him center. before the BBC guy did. Yes. This was the first one. The true Hollywood story of how the left overtook your TV. <laughs> Primetime propaganda. Welcome to Connie Martinson Talks Books. She's cool. You watch a TV show and you start laughing, but afterwards, do you think about what maybe was said or what you've been uh, really recommended to believe? <laughs> My guest today, Ben Shapiro, has written Primetime Propaganda, the true Hollywood story of how the left has... Uh, made our country took over your tv and it's published by harper i love how she wins welcome this. welcome ben and thanks so much for having me <laughs> She's already and laughing I, I guess one has to think about things we have laughed at but you seem to pinpoint the authors of those shows as being liberal jews uh, well, not all of them. I mean, Susan Harris is not Jewish. There are plenty. Nor of, is Gary Marshall. Nor is Gary Marshall. I don't. I certainly don't say that all of them are Jewish. Well, there, there's, of course, a lot of Jews in Hollywood, but that's because there are a lot of Jews at the top of any industry. Jews happen to be very hardworking. <laughs> um, well, pause they, it. Let me just pause it. For a second. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, seriously. Seriously? I don't like where this is going. Wow, this is. Yeah, if you actually set aside uh, protocols of the elders, Zion actually had a lot of legitimate ideas right. about Jewish work ethic. Jews work 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 very hard. Very right. 
industry. Jews happen to be very hardworking. <laughs> um, the, no, no, no. It isn't just that. They have a point of view that can be considered comic and humorous. Uh, that, that's true. I mean, there's a unique brand of Jewish humor, and that's been true since the beginning. I mean, go back to your show of shows. Everybody in that writer's room is a New York Jew. Um, and, that's, and that's good. I mean, this is good stuff. Stop writing I mean, our cocktails, Ben Shapiro. Jews. I mean, that's, that would be ridiculous. Uh, the point, and, and by the way, but one of the points I make who, in the book yeah. is that the book is that the people who write TV are incredibly talented. That they have a political agenda, but they're very talented. Well, let me say, I've yet to know of too many conservatives, which is where you put yourself, who are funny. I mean, <laughs> it has to do with a humor that is transferable to hu to this is the best. everyday this living. This is the best. I mean, I. I, I Utterly disagree with that. I think there there can be conservatives who are funny. Liberals Whoa. may not find them funny. All right. Oh, I mean, a, okay. Ann Coulter for conservatives is funny. Okay, for liberals, <laughs> she's not funny. Bill Maher for liberals, hilarious. For conservatives, not funny. Okay. okay there's well, that depends because you're using politics as the, the uh, form of their humor. But Bill Cosby is relatively conservative <laughs> today. That's true. Yeah, and no, even back then. Uh, a, that's that's you know the the idea that conservatism is inherently unfunny is not true. It's that conservatives have abandoned the playing field of humor and narrative. I'll agree with you there. I think that they've totally run away Politic. from that. <laughs> so many. I you got to pull that. Conservatives have abandoned the playing field of comedy and humor. Well, like there's so what? many young comedians you read it, like they're like they they were obsessed with the classics with Pryor with Carlin with staying up all night watching Vintage Saturday Night Live, but then they were like, I'm not going to go into it, though, because I'm going to seed the battlefield mm. comedy in the culture war. Well, I, I got to say this. That's back, totally the upshot of a passion for back, comedy. Uh, back when uh, I was uh, starting out as a stand-up, you'd hear a lot of guys and, and women who would come in, and uh, you'd be late night at, uh, you know, Catch a Rising Star in the basement of some place in Cambridge, and people would say, like... I don't know. I feel like maybe I should just abandon the bay, the, the the battlefield. <laughs> Did you ever say it to yourself, Sam? You're like, I don't even want to do this, but this is a vital part of the battlefield. Did I, you ever was. say it to yourself? I would say things to myself like, I feel like I want to yeah. get a job where I can get a consistent income, and then I was like, but I can't. I can't take the tent down yeah. <laughs> in the encampment I've created on this battle. Yeah, going AWOL from the battle yeah. of humor. <laughs> Who will do Gen X Andy Kaufman jokes that promote the leftist agenda? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that actually was probably what I was saying. But Is not true. It's the conservatives have abandoned the playing field of humor and narrative. I'll agree with you there. I think that they've totally run away from the battle. But that doesn't mean that there's not the capacity within conservative thought to be funny. You talk about mm, having tell. conceived yeah. of uh, the plot for a TV series and worked with Lenny Goldberg. Mm -hmm. Was that a comedy? Was it sitcom? Was it drama? It was more of a dramedy. It was based on Harvard Law School. It was a dramedy. I, I've written a couple comedies, uh, kind of hour-long dramedies for uh, you know spec script. And oh, have they been bought? Guy. Uh, no, because <laughs> no, it, no and, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that it's hard to sell anything in this town. Yeah, thank um, you. <laughs> period. You know, regardless of political viewpoint. Uh -huh. um, and uh, the other is that, you know, and, and especially a breakout series right, right from the get-go, right? I mean, it's yeah. hard to sell a spec script. You start as a baby writer. I mean, you know the process. Yeah. Have you worked continually with Lenny Goldberg since? Uh, yeah, I worked with him for several months afterward, and then he got sidetracked with Unknown and with... Uh, Blue Bloods on CBS and, Pause, and all of that. I just want to just and understand you, the frame uh, that he's there. He was working on me on these all these failures, and then he got sidetracked because he got a job on a series. <laughs> 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 that was the sidetrack. He actually got hired as a professional writer, and I was not, and so he got sidetracked. He lost sense of the. Yeah. He, in many respects, uh, went awol like, in the uh, in the war. <laughs> the seated the battlefield. Is that like and, how uh, and retreated to a paid job in writing uh, drama? He seated the narrative is by that, getting a full time job at a prestigious chef. Is that like how Marin got sidetracked after Break Room Live? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. He exactly. got sidetracked with yeah, the podcast in his garage. With, uh, with, that's um, why he was talking WTF. to Obama. Yeah, exactly. because we, that's yeah. why we don't do the yeah, exactly. live he got He got sidetracked. <laughs> I've had a lot of friends who have gotten so sidetracked <laughs> by taking some type of big movie job or something. It's just real shame to see that happen. 
where they lose their focus on me. So, what I didn't understand is why he wanted to do that when we could have right. watched old clips of me on Spin City in exactly. eternity. Um, <laughs> uh, Break Room Live was just about to explode and be successful, and then he decided to get sidetracked by that other show that he's doing. So. Yeah, you know, like everything else in Hollywood, things go into development, and then yeah. they kind of get sidetracked. They go sideways for a while. So, well, do you think the book will help Poor sort of bastard. open the door with him again? And that wasn't the point of the book, but you know, well, <laughs> he he knew what was going on with the book. It was not a hit job on Leonard Goldberg. I treat him very well in the book. In fact, most of the people in the book I treat very well for the most part. I talk about how talented and brilliant they are. I talk about how great their shows are, which they are, and that's not a bad thing. I just point out that look, I'm a legal realist. Yeah, you know, I'm a lawyer. I went to Harvard Law School. And in law, the idea, there, there's a, a, an idea that was promulgated by the left in the 1960s called legal realism. What it was God. is the idea that your politics are going to come out in your interpretation of law. That is the same thing that's true in art. Okay, your politics are going to come out in your creation and interpretation of art. And that's one of the points of the book. The people who I'm talking to are not bad people. A lot of them are not. Some of them are not even doing it purposefully. Some of them are doing it purposefully. But it's coming out in their work. And, and the one thing above all that Hollywood does right now that is utterly despicable is that they keep people who are not of their political ilk out of the business, period, end of story. <laughs> that is I have them on tape admitting this. I have high-ranking members of, of you know, the WGA. I have high-ranking members of the caucus for producers, writers, and directors. I have high-ranking members of the DGA. I have people talking about this openly and recognizing that it occurs. Now, pause uh, it. Now, I, I got to tell you that I, um, <laughs> uh, I was in show business. I wrote... Um, I think probably off the top of my head, eight to 10 scripts that were commissioned by every single major network that there uh, is, some that were, um, and uh, several of the cable networks. And almost the first question, you would give what they call sort of the elevator pitch, and then you would start to go into the characters as you go in into these meetings. But before you would get to any of that, was you would have to tell them what your voting uh, <laughs> record was. What um, happened to those scripts? They um, went sideways. They went sideways. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, the people got sidetracked. You side know what it is. People uh, side uh, A lot of these sideways. networks, uh, AMC got very sidetracked. I had uh, written a script for them, and then they just sort of pursued like uh, the walking. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they got sidetracked. I would love to that. watch you. Well, you know what? I would love to see you write an episode of The Walking Dead. That I would be the first episode. No, I, of that show I, I, watch. I wrote exclusively uh, comedies, and then what I would call dramedies, dramedies, which is what we call comedies that are not funny. Yeah. <laughs> That's you know what, what I love about of, this yeah. is that he – okay, I didn't read this book, obviously. But you know how, like, the, the Ben Shapiro we know now is, like, does not even have a modicum of, like, well, I mean, they're talented people. He's just, like, right, always a dick. Right. And so my interpretation is that this book obviously is a plea for a job. So he's calibrating, like, I got to get booked – and talk with all the rubes and bitch about Hollywood and say that they're a bunch of unethical elitists ramming their culture down our throats, blah, blah. But at the same time, you guys are all really talented and it would be great if I right. get some work in a right. dramedy series. Right. Maybe I wouldn't have to write right. these stupid I mean, fucking books right. I started doing when I was 12. We, again, I think he we, should have written this. a script about being a teen conservative prodigy. And the psychosis of that, that would have been a fascinating, dark, disturbing comedy. I, that would have hit, hit too hard at yeah. home. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but again, you know, this is dramedy. something, uh, you know, if someone like Norman Lear, um, he, he, Norman Lear funded the People for American Way, had he uh, just established a three to five million dollar endowment? to periodically hire people like Ben Shapiro, keep them <laughs> from actually uh, feeling the resent that fuels their entire uh, you know, new career as a conservative talker. Um, I think we would be in much <laughs> better shape. Like you could have saved uh, millions of dollars of advocacy just by giving these guys a job and telling them like, this is great stuff. I barely man. even know what this show is, but my I, when I first saw Andrew Breitbart, I was like, why the hell did they not just give him talk soup? Right, exactly. <laughs> and he wouldn't be doing this. He would just right. be like, whoa, well, they caught up with Courtney Cox at the red at the red carpet. He's partly right, though. Like, art is always going to be a vehicle for ideology. And Hollywood certainly has an ideology. Um, but of the numerous groups of people who've been kept out of Hollywood for their ideology, 
I'm going to guess he's not too concerned about the literal purges that happened of communists and people suspected of being communists. No, that was cool. She mentions that actually later in the interview. It's a good one. Uh, if you just search primetime propaganda on YouTube, uh, it'll come up. Um, we should also, do this Yang sucks. silence thing. though. Too. Yang was silenced, right. All right, let's, uh, let's look at uh, something else. Um, whoa. Mm. Is this right? The microphone was actually cut. I mean, we can analyze it. I'm let's, a bit. Let's scared. do it. Let's. Let, this is. Marianne this guy has been. Off, guys. Okay, so this guy is a UBI. Um, uh, the uh, the the Twitter. He is a, a UBI a guy, and here is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we need to go home soon. <laughs> yeah. Here is a. Uh, yeah. It's the ping pong ball between like a few people, and you're just like, all right, let's see what we have. <laughs> And, and there were also a few times, FYI, where I just started talking, being like, hey, I'd like to add something there, and my mic was like, not on. Like, yeah, it, it's yeah. the sort of thing where, it, it, it's not like if you start talking, like, it all of a sudden, like, takes over the convo. It's like, I was talking, and like... All right, so he's claiming, uh, Yang is claiming that he... Oh, we have proof now. Now that, well, that he, his mic was shut down. This, of course, happens. We hear this quite a bit on this program. People uh, say, uh, you, sh you, you turned down my mic. I think uh, Michael Tracy said that. Sargon also said that. Uh, Sargon, Sargon did. We, don't, we, no, we do have the ability to do that, but we don't. We don't. I could what do it. What happens is when you're talking with somebody over Skype, if there's an auto well, well, auto, yeah. but we were talking to Michael Tracy on the phone. I was just yelling. Oh, he wasn't. On I Skype. was just loud. Oh, you were cutting him off. Actually, <laughs> right. Sam was just. Being... You were literally cutting him off. I was saying, alchemy. shut up. Yeah, yeah you weren't yeah. using a button to do. Stop it. talking. Anyway. Hello. We expose him for the fraud that he is. I disagree with both their perspectives. <laughs> I heard do not blame the microphone yeah, for that, homie. Yeah. That is not the microphone. That's just you, lack of assertiveness. Yeah, you have to talk until they are forced to put your microphone yeah. up because you're continuing to talk. Well, he was talk. talking, but you need to talk through you it. You need That's to what, talk I mean, through it. I mean, look, Christian Gillibrand did that several times and said nothing. She commandeered the floor right. and delivered zero value. So you just got to be belligerent. Sorry, also, sure. Listen, folks, we all know how much the media likes Bernie Sanders and wouldn't cut off his mic. So they're going right. after Andrew Yang, you know? Right. That was great, though. It's like, it's like they cut off. Hey, guys. Can I, if, yeah. Hey, Sam, can I just... I tried. He, he, you, he's got no one but himself to blame because yes. if you look at the time, the amount of minutes and, and, everyone and, spoke, even like Bill de Blasio and Tim Ryan each spoke for like four and a half minutes. Oh, Andrew uh, Yang spoke for two and a half minutes. Bill de Blasio minutes, definitely sad, knew man. how to get the people that's to pick up his mic. But if that's have, just sad, man. Like if you're that far down and like you, you're on TV for two hours and can't talk for more than two and a half uh, minutes when uh, everyone right. else spoke at the very least for four and a half minutes, like come on, if that's you your a, fault. If you have a world changing idea, you should... Uh, <laughs> Present like it. <laughs> all right, we got to get to this stuff because I got to literally go in seven, eight minutes. Um, all right, this is let's do this segment where Kamala Harris basically uh, began the beginning of the end, which I, I, I this is my assessment, and 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 it could be wrong, but again, Joe Biden is Joe Biden in this race because he is perceived as being uh, rock solid, and here is where he's not. We've also heard, and I'm going to now direct this at Vice President Biden. Um, I do not believe you are a racist. And I agree with you when you commit yourself to the importance of finding common ground. Mm -hmm. But I also believe, and it's personal, and I was actually very, it was hurtful, to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. And it was not only that, but you also worked with them to oppose busing. And, you know, there was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools. And she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. So I will tell you that on this subject, it cannot be an intellectual debate among Democrats. We have to take it seriously. We have to act swiftly. As Attorney General of California, I was very proud to put in place a, a requirement that all my special agents would wear body cameras and keep those cameras on. Senator Harris, thank, thank you. you. Vice President Biden, you have been invoked. We are going to give you a chance to respond. Shush. Oh. 
Vice President. Yes. Jesus, shut up. It's a pause it for one second. Oh, no, put, put, pause it before we get to his response. Because here he is. This is this is the moment, right? Where first of all, she helps herself in this instance. A lot. Because she's basically saying, like, I'm not afraid to go at you straight on. I've done it well. I waited. I bided my time. I bided my time. Excuse me. And um, and and she goes at him. And, and you can see, you know, Biden was doing the thing like where you do not look. That's what they tell you from a communication standpoint. But the way that she dropped that, that was me. It compelled him to look, which is a little bit problematic. So how do you come back at this moment? And. The way that you come back at this moment is you, you, well, basically it's like an old improv thing. You don't deny, right? I mean, because there's nothing she said that didn't comport with everyone's understanding of what happened. But Biden chickens out. No, he says yes and, but you're a cop. No, he chickens out. He says, no, I didn't say that. Watch what he says here. It's a mischaracterization of my position across the board. I do not praise racist. That is not true, number one. Number two, if we want to have this campaign litigated on who supports civil rights and whether I did or not, I'm happy to do that. I was a public defender. I didn't become a prosecutor. I came out, I left a good law firm to become a public defender. When in fact, when in fact, when in fact my city was in flames because of the, the uh, assassination of Dr. King. Number one. Not number two. Now, as the U.S. Att- excuse me, now, as now, the, uh, now he is. First of all, he was on number two already. Uh, I don't know if you caught that. Number one was you mischaracterized me. Number two, I didn't become a prosecutor, uh, and I'm willing to put my civil rights. You know. Right. So he, and then he comes back to number one, and then goes right. to number two. So here he is. He's completely off track. First off, he denies what everybody heard him say. Right. He denied what he bragged about. And that's where he lost this. The comment about the prosecutor, there's none of his people who care that she's a prosecutor. Right, yeah. right. Her people, that's what impresses them about, right. about that's her. That's right. And it so was a he's, good line, though. He, I line. mean, it was a good line, but not for anybody who cares. Burn your bus bill loved it. Exactly. Yeah. It's a great line. She's a fucking I'm number two. As the U.S., as, excuse me, as the... Uh, uh, Vice President of the United States, I work with a man who, in fact, we worked very hard to see to it we dealt with these issues in a major, major way. The fact is that in terms of busing, the busing, I never, you would have been able to go to school the same exact way because it was a local decision made by your city council. That's fine. That's one of the things I argued for, that we should not be, we should be breaking down these lines. But so the bottom line here is, look, Everything I've done in my career, I ran because of civil rights. I continue to think we have to make fundamental changes in civil rights. And those civil rights, by the way, include not just only African-Americans, but the LGBT community. But they, uh, Vice President Biden, do you agree today, do you agree today that you were wrong to oppose busing in America then? No, do you agree? I did not oppose busing in America. What I opposed is busing ordered by the Department of Education. That's what I oppose. Well, I there did was not a oppose. failure of, of states to, to integrate no, public schools in America. I was part of the, the second class to integrate Berkeley, the, California public schools almost two decades after Brown v. Board of Education. Because your city council made that decision. It was a so local decision. So that's where the federal government must step now, in. That's why we have the Voting step- Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. That's why we need to pass the Equality Act. That's why we need to pass the ERA, because that, there are moments in history where states fail to preserve the civil rights of I all people. I have supported the okay, ERA yeah. from the very beginning when Vice I ran President Biden, 30 seconds, because I want to bring you know, other people into this. I supported I the ERA from the very beginning. I'm the guy that extended the Voting Rights Act for 25 years. I did that myself. We got myself. to the place where we got 98 out of 98 votes in the United States Senate doing it. I've also argued very strongly that we, in fact, deal with the notion of denying people access to the ballot box. I agree that everybody, once they, in fact, they should, anyway, my time. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, now, that was sad. what's really bad, and, it, and we're seeing this today, and we said it last night, he is using states' rights as a defense. So I mean, he's using municipalities' rights yeah. as a defense. But this is exactly, exactly what the civil rights fight was about. 
Barry Goldwater 64. It I mean, also low-key highlights how much older than her he is, right? If well, he was trying to deny her integration when she was a kid. Yeah, right. I mean, I think what's, what's like the only path for him, and this must just be his egotism, is to just say, frankly, like, this is just no values, just political advice. I was totally wrong. I've done X, Y, and Z, and I was a senator in the 70s from Delaware, and that was politically untenable. He could exactly. totally say that, and what, what, it would be a legit thing to say. I think he could have just said, like, look, uh, at the time I had to do that, and today I look back on it, I have regrets. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's exactly absolutely. what I'm saying. You explain the political reality, the idea that you're going to—I mean, look, we'll get him, oh, like, okay, you weren't a brave leader. You didn't have a conscience. You weren't willing to risk your neck. We already know that. What's the second step? You apologize, talk about the history, and center it to today. The third step is that was your, it was in right. San Francisco, baby. <laughs> yeah, but other was, places, maybe they didn't off. want it. But look, I was friends with Barack. Anyways, I can't he talk forgot, anymore. He even forgot what the original reason right. why he brought that stuff up was. Right. Like he should have said, like, look, I wanted to get to a win. And if I hadn't done that, we wouldn't have even had the busing. You wouldn't even had the opportunity to bus. Uh, and she didn't. Which would have been a lie. It would have been a lie. But, I, mean, she didn't, I just want everybody to remind everybody the letter that the Washington Post that he wrote to Eastland in '77, saying thank you for working with me on busing. I mean, this yeah. is appalling. No, appalling. everyone knows what right. it means when someone evokes states' rights. Right. All right. Um, lastly, let's do the, which one we play. Should we play this uh, Cotton or Kill Me? I thought maybe we could round it out. Yes, let's round out our uh, week. With, of course, <laughs> uh, some expert analysis of uh, the 2020 Democrat debate night two. They are even using that in the uh, in their Chiron. Right. They won't even say Democratic debate night two. Unbelievable. Um, here is Fox and Friend. And uh, what is it? Silk and diamond Simon and silk. silk. Diamond and silk. Oh, diamond, and yeah. silk. diamond and silk. Uh, giving the analysis. <laughs> Luxury commodities. I think on some level, Diamond, the Democrats don't want this argument for the main reason is they're the ones who gave birth to the Ku Klux Klan. It was a Republican right. that uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's party <laughs> that up until the 1960s uh, that would fall, push back against racism. And somehow right. that narrative flipped and people are forced to somehow. go back to remember what Wait Senator Wait a second. Burr Wait a second. We're going to play this back because he's just told you. What happened with <laughs> right. the parties, which they never want. They went a little too far. They were the party that fought back against racism until the 1960s. Right. Something and happened somehow with the things flipped. So in other words, I think Kilmeade is going with the old. You don't measure uh, a party based upon how racist they are now. But you measure about how many years in their existence they've been racist. It's, you know, you can do it a bunch of different ways. Go ahead. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's party that oh, up until the 1960s uh, <laughs> that would fall push back against racism and somehow right. that narrative flipped and people are forced to go back and remember what Senator Byrd was uh, and even exactly. though every road is named after him and every hallway has a plaque with his face on it well, that's, that's right. an amazing should we remove those plaques? Well, also, yeah. well, that's Let's number one. Number two, yeah. though, that's an amazing point because Robert Byrd was a member of the Klan and whatever else you think of him, he apologized endlessly throughout his career. And of course, he was one of the first Senate Democrats to endorse Obama as clearly as part of his desire to make up for that. Strom Thurmond and Jesse Helms both became Republicans and were ardent racists throughout the aughts. Yeah. So, oh, OK. Yeah. But how many years, <laughs> Michael? Has it been since the mid-60s? Right. Right? That's it's been point. less than 50 years. I'm about 50 years. But how many years before that were the Democrats racist? Dude, it was longer. I Kill Mead, game, set, match. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, that does it for this week. Matt Binder, thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. YouTube.com slash Matt Binder. Patreon.com slash Matt Binder. Go check it out, folks. All right. We will see you on Monday. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better 